Good evening, everyone. September 25th meeting of Dublin City Council to order. Uh, Ann, could you please call the roll? Uh, Ms. Sale. I'm sorry, she's not here yet. Uh, Mr. Lechleiter. Here. Mr. Keenan. Here. Ms. Aludo. Here. Mayor Peterson. Here. Ms. Amaros Groom. Here. And Tim, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Amy has um, appeared. Special presentations. Perk? Kathy? Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Good, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kathy Harder. I'm at 7825 Holliston Court. Uh, thank you, Mayor Peterson and Council, for this opportunity to come and talk to you about PERC. Um, as you know, PERC is Parents Encouraging Responsible Choices, and we are um, an extension of the PTOs from Dublin City Schools, and we started, I think we're starting on our 10th year, um, developing this programming for schools um, throughout the year, and many of you have been involved from day one, and we thank you for that. Uh, this year, we have a very exciting program that I wanted to update you on. First of all, last week we had family Family Night, Dublin Family Night, and um, a little change to it. It was called Making a Device-Free Night here in Dublin, and uh, it, we um, shortened it by DFN. The goal of Family Night is to encourage families to take the evening and focus on each other and spend time together as a family. Um, Dr. Hoadley sends out an email to all the teachers and uh, asking for no homework that night. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, also, on October 18th, this is really important to us, and a main reason why I'm here is because um, it's about um, the, the suicide prevention. Our topic is moving beyond 13 reasons why, sharing the message of hope and healing around suicide. We're asking parents not just to go for their own family, but for all the families um, here in Dublin. It takes everyone to be aware of the new ways to detect if someone is thinking about suicide. We have great speakers that evening. We have Desiree uh, Stage. Um, she speaks around the country on suicide prevention, and she's going to bring some new ideas and some scientific ways um, that can help um, our community. Um, she's also a survivor and um, has a personal story to share. We want to bring also the community involved too. So we have John Ackerman from Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's the coordinator at the Center of Suicide Prevention and Research. Um, Susan Ortega works in our schools here. Um, she's with Centero. She's a director of youth and prevention services and works in our schools as I just mentioned. Um, it's important, again, that we get families to come that have been touched by su suicidal thoughts, as well as families who have not. This is a community issue, and we all need to learn about uh, these new facts. So um, we uh, could have not done this program without the support of the Dublin Realtors Association and, of course, Dublin Schools. You can help by everyone in this room emailing friends and asking them to come, because that's what it takes. It takes personal um, invitations. And we'll be over at the Abbey Theater, and I, I really um, um, encourage you to uh, get the message out. Um, and uh, the school district also will be um, sending it out to their teachers and so forth, too. And they've been having things internally as well. But um, everyone who um, is with our children um, should be there. Um, December 6th, we will be bringing back um, Norman Shubb. He's the clinical director of Gasalt's. Institute, and uh, he's here in Columbus. Um, he will be talking about empowering your child and um, giving them, giving parents skills in their tool, toolbox to help their child to self-advocate, be assertive, and also um, do a resolution conflict. Um, and then, um, but he's great in the field and, and really gets it out to the parents about um, how to help um, kids and your own kids. Then we get to February. February 28th, we will be working with Centero, and the topic is Let Them Fall, Watch Them Soar. And we love this topic because um, what a great place um, when you're in a Dublin bubble 
to uh, allow them to fall and then, and then let them learn from that. So, um, and Centero is close within our schools and we feel like this is going to be a wonderful program um, to um, bring forward. We do two programs with most of these. You do one in the morning and one in the afternoon. We provide babysitting. Um, the high school students do the evening and then over at the Dublin Rec Center um, helps us out during the day, which has been great. We're excited about March 14th. It's called Changing the Game. The, miss, the mission of changing the game is to ensure that we return, our, return youth sports to our children and put play back into play ball. We expect so much out of our kids and lose perspective that they're just kids growing up. This program helps parents to keep sports healthy, positive, and rewarding. We hope to get the word out to all of our sports organizations as well, too, and within the schools. We think this one's a really good one for parents. Um, I thank you again. We like coming here uh, each year because it gives um, you all a taste about what we're doing and what kind of programs that are out there. Um, and um, we appreciate all your support that you have uh, given us over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Real, real quick, those of you that don't know her, she is, I don't know how you find how the, the hours in the day to do what you do. Um, you participate in the ACT Coalition and, and the PERC organization that you founded and all that. It, 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 you represent all that is good about citizen involvement in this community. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate this. We time. greatly appreciate it. And if I didn't have kids the age that I do, I wouldn't know what 13 Reasons Why is, but it's, it's a terrifically tragic movie. Right. about a young lady who commits suicide and before she does that she films 13 reasons why she did. Mm -hmm. Exactly and many of our kids in Dublin watch that uh, either by themselves maybe with a parent maybe in a college dorm and people didn't even know that their kids were doing this and so it's bringing attention to that and people were shocked to find out about what this was and binging is another watching movies over and over and over again um, consecutively uh, also has um, some attributes that are can be very devastating and um, it's bringing that word out about that and Children's Hospital will be discussing a lot of that as, as well as our speaker Desiree. I, and obviously the other events are important but the first one is October 18th. Yes. Is this one. Yes. Um, it is an unbelievably important topic. Yeah. Um, obviously and, and at least you know with the opioid epidemics and everything else we are learning that we've got to be brave and confront these issues. We can't hide them. And there's new ways of dealing with it now. And so we're going to bring those forward. Dublin Schools is working on those issues as well, too. And um, it's just educating everybody. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Does any council have any questions for Kathy? I just wanted to thank Kathy for your leadership over the years. And if you could bring our thanks to the entire PERC committee and tell them how much we appreciate your work. Um, it truly is, you know, you guys, you know, the term, it takes a village. Right. You are such a huge part of the village, and I know when this group began all those years ago, the power, I think folks realize the power of bringing parents together in the same room just to start a conversation, and it started that simply, and now, you know, you're up there talk, tackling these huge, Biggest. huge issues, and, um, and then also, you know, the, the ones that are not so huge, but making parents feel like they're not alone exactly. is is wonderful and then just bringing the communication and the, the conversation I should say about suicide mm -hmm. because when it comes out of the shadows it's not nearly so scary and you know it's okay exactly. to just ask somebody exactly. what, you know what they're feeling what they're thinking mm -hmm. so thank you for this this yeah, is huge and, and everything that you've done over, over the years thank you thanks thank you. thank you very thank much you. Kathy Scott So you guys mind if I drive over here? Um, if I could, I'd also like to introduce your two city council reps that are here with us tonight, Frank Wilson and uh, Phil Smith that are back there. So, so thank you for that. Um, every year uh, we create a very detailed and execute a very detailed sales and marketing plan uh, with really two main goals. One is to raise awareness and profile the city of Dublin nationwide, and the other is to really attract visitors and their travel dollars to the city. 
Um, and we do this through hundreds of initiatives that we evaluate every year. And we want to just take a couple minutes and highlight three of those key initiatives here in the, the five minutes or less that we have with you. And uh, one is the regional awareness campaign that we launched this year, um, attracting new business and, of course, downtown Dublin. Uh, the, the regional campaign that we launched this year uh, was through April through uh, the month of July, and it really focused on Pittsburgh, Detroit, Indianapolis, and Lexington. And obviously, this is very much a tourism message, but there's no question when you're out there raising awareness of Dublin, raising the profile of Dublin, and it also helps raise awareness of our community as a business, location for a business, future residents, and so forth. So it really works out there and, and promotes the city um, overall. Uh, this campaign, we went to the, those four markets at the beginning of the year to figure out exactly what our key messages were. Um, the results of that research told us there was great awareness of Dublin um, as a city, but there was a little lack of awareness of what there was to do here in the city during, during the summer months. So we identified three kind of unique um, attractions, I guess you could say, that really resonate with those folks. Um, the, the zoo, obviously, a major family attraction, the, the 30th anniversary of the Irish Festival and the Ferry Door Trail. So these aren't all we have to offer in the summer, but we felt they were kind of unique and different and something that really would re resonate with those visitors in those four markets. Um, it was really a three-pronged approach through this campaign. It was out of home, geofencing, mobile ads, and, and retargeting. I'll talk about these real briefly. The out of home um, for the first part of this were we really went to those four markets and, uh, and, and attacked these shelters. And these shelters were all over Lexington, um, Detroit, Indianapolis, um, and Pittsburgh. You can kind of see it was very towards family-oriented type areas. So these two, for example, are, are Carnegie Science Center, Pittsburgh Zoo, Indianapolis Zoo. Things are really high traffic with families, really targeted toward that. So those <clears throat> uh, shelters were really covered with our key messages. You can kind of see their ferry door there. And, in the Irish Festival message uh, with those shelters. The other key area we did was something called street decals. And you may have seen these during the Irish Festival, um, but very effective. These were kind of the key messages that, that we had here, promoting the, the Irish Festival and saying beneath your feet and um, you know, follow the steps to the Columbus Zoo and the Ferry Door Trail. And these were strategically placed throughout the entire summer in, again, high traffic areas and key family spots. So for a good example here is that in the left is the NCAA Hall of Fame in Indianapolis. Carnegie Center in, in Pittsburgh and in, in Detroit area. Here's one in the Pittsburgh incline overlooking the city of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh. So um, these were strategically placed, again, raising awareness of the city and these out of touch, out of home type messages as well. And then we went to geofencing. So if you kind of bear with me here now, what this is, let's say a family of four is going to the Pittsburgh Zoo. We literally created what we call a virtual fence around the, the Pittsburgh Zoo. So when someone walks in their family, they're in that virtual fence of ours, they see maybe that street decal, they see that shelter, they get on their phone, the Twitter account here, and then they're actually served magically a digital ad from us um, in, that, in that virtual um, fence they have. And again, I think the unique thing about this, sometimes you click on these digital ads and they go just to major kind of sites. We created three specific landing pages for the Irish Festival, the Ferry Door Trail, um, and the Columbus Zoo. So once they got that information, it directed them direct to that site, and they got more information on that area as well. Um, here's another example. Here's just someone happened to pop on the Weather Channel in one of these virtual fences. They got our digital ad, Fromers, et cetera. <clears throat> the other key thing that we had was video as part of this. And we created a 30-second video as part of this. So if you happen to go on YouTube when you're in one of these areas, we actually gave you an opportunity to, to view one of our 30-second ads. So we're going to see if this works here. And I'll show you. So that was just a 30-second video. It was an option of watching as well. So the last element of this campaign is probably the most important part, and that's retargeting. So this is kind of an academic type of, of graph. But you can kind of see we have the prospect. That's the family in Pittsburgh. They're walking by. They see our site. They click on one of those digital ads, and we got them tracked right away once they click on it. They leave our site. And then we actually, down the road, maybe the next day, we actually feed them an ad 
and they're on another site. So a good example of this, and I think this has all happened off. So let's say Mayor Peterson was looking for a baseball bat or baseball glove for his son. He was looking on Google, looking at different things, um, visiting different sites, didn't find anything. The next day he's on his Facebook page, and magically there's a, a, a banner ad from Dick's that says a special ad um, for gloves and, and bats on it. So that's kind of the same concept that we used to retargeting people. And again, again, this is creating that kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship we're trying to cover with the customer as well when we're attracting here in Dublin. The results, um, again, this was an awareness campaign. So you know, these were the key impressions that, and impressions is really was our key metric. 1.4 million of these out of town, out of home impressions in these key markets, well above our average goal, 64% above. Digital impressions almost 6 million, 5% above goal. The CTR is the click-through rate. Um, we are 6% above goal. What even more impressive is we are three times the industry average on that click-through rate. And then that last bullet point I just cut through in here because it's pretty remarkable was that video that we showed you. If you guys go on YouTube and you, you, before you get whatever video you get, you sometimes you see a video and it say, click on here, it'll be over in 10 seconds or 8 seconds. 77% of the people that saw that video watched the whole 30 seconds of the video. Um, so I think it says a lot for our city and a lot of interest um, for our city as well for that. Um, the tangible results, um, you know, Ferry Door Trail this summer, that's going crazy, 2,000 plus customers. Interesting, some stats on this. Of those 2,100 plus customers, 25% are from out of state um, residents that filled that out. Of that 25%, half of that were from our four markets of Pittsburgh, Detroit, Lexington, and Indianapolis. So, um, it's not a coincidence that we really hit those people as well. The last two, by no means are we taking any credit for the zoos and the Irish Festival success this summer. You know, the, the zoos, I think it's the second largest attendance they had all, all in their history. Um, we know how great the, the Irish Festival did with the one-day record attendance on, on Saturday. But um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, four months of going in those outer markets and promoting the Ferry Door Trail, the zoo, and the festival had some kind of impact as well, but we're not going to take any credit for, for those last two as well. So that's the regional campaign. Quickly, the new business. Again, we were here a couple last month or so talking about the sports and, and the exciting part about the, the um, archery and the tandem bike. This includes none of that. So this is purely business travel. Um, these are meetings that we go out and get um, that aren't nearly as exciting as the archery or tandem bike. Things like the Ohio Mayor's Conference, which I'm sure is very exciting, um, that was here in Dublin as well. But, um, you know, we have in, um, uh, some other various things we had. There's a police event we had here as well. So these are events that are held here every single week, every day um, that we go after. Um, we had 49 of those that we directly booked. That $1.35 million is a real number. A lot of times you hear a lot of these multipliers and economic impact. These, that's a real number where we know exactly um, who we booked, how much they spent at a hotel, how much they spent on their restaurant, how much they spent um, AV or whatever it might be. So I actually had another bullet point below that on the whole economic impact, but it's unbelievable what it would be. It's in the $10, $20 million range. But that $1.35 million is a real number, tangible number that we brought in. And of course, what, a metric that we all look at and, and are important to is the bed tax, and that uh, served as a record over 3.2 million last year. And then finally, <clears throat> we know we started this last year. Uh, I won't go into this because I know the alliance. We're going to be back here in January to give you a report as a group. Um, but I think the good message here is that we're meeting on a monthly basis. There's things happening. There's collaboration happening. Um, a, big, a shout out to, to Michelle and Dana and Sue and Allison from the city's perspective, they've been a great supporter of this. And uh, we're talking, we're communicating, we're working together on various things. So it's, uh, it's something that's gonna really help grow and, and make sure that downtown Dublin area succeeds in the future. And that's all I have, so I'm happy to answer any great. questions. Thanks, Scott. It, it's yeah. amazing that you can do that targeted marketing kind of technology thing. But the fact that you get the feedback that actually allows you to track the results from that targeted marketing is probably as, as helpful to have that information as is the marketing in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What works, we track everything we do. And if it's not working, we'll try something else. That's sure. fantastic. We greatly appreciate everything you do for our community. Yeah. Any questions from council? Thank you. Okay. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Moving on to citizen comments. All right. There is, um, there have been quite a few people here almost an hour's worth of testimony that have, that have signed in on a particular issue. And I'm going to go in a little bit of a different order here so that those of us that maybe aren't as familiar with the issue can have it laid out for us. This has to do with the sidewalks down at Mid-Century 
um, the sidewalks and the cutters and the curbs and all of that sort of stuff. What I would like for either Michelle or Megan, someone to do, this, this issue has come up over the last couple of weeks and we've been talking about it. If you could sort of give us an overview of what the state of affairs may be, I think then when people step up and make comments, I think council will have a much better appreciation of what it is they're talking about. Sure, I can. Fair enough. Give I, it a shot, Michelle. Do the best can you can. I'm sure you Provide you're some fine. background on this uh, topic. This project is for street improvements along Grandview Drive, Longview Drive, Marion Street, Franklin Street, and Montserrat Drive. Included in this is uh, curb and gutter, enclosed storm sewer, and sidewalks. This project was approved in 2016 CIP for design, in 2017 for construction. Uh, this was actually initiated by the residents in mid-century neighborhood and they came forward to council in both August and September of 2015 um, as part of part of their presentation to council they had conducted a survey of the residents in this neighborhood of the respondents to the survey 87% um, of the residents were in favor of these types of improvements 13% were not in favor of these type of improvements and in uh, as, as I mentioned in 2015 council did approve this project and the co total cost was for 2.8 million dollars during 2016 after staff had some initial design completed they did hold several public input sessions one I believe was in April of 2016 and then there was an option for two separate but the same presentation in August. Um, this uh, project is currently underway. I believe we have three or four property owners this evening that are along Mont Montserrat Drive that um, are not in favor of sidewalks being installed along their, their portion of the street. And I think they're going to speak tonight to that. Uh, staff's recommendation is that this project move forward as planned and for some of the same reasons that were articulated when when um, this Civic Association came forward for this project and I'll just mention those uh, we, we believe that this section of Montserrat is a key connection for a complete system of sidewalks within this neighborhood it provides for safe pedestrian friendly environment that benefits the community as a whole uh, as, as I mentioned, these were the goals, of the primary purpose of, of the project. It does align with city code and council's longstanding policy of providing sidewalks or shared use paths on both sides of residential streets. You may recall that mid-century uh, at one point uh, asked that only one side of the street have sidewalks and council at that time did enforce the longstanding policy and wanted to move forward with sidewalks on both sides of the street. It is being constructed completely within the public right of way, and the street trees have already been re um, removed to allow for this sidewalk. Uh, one other final note is if this sidewalk would be excluded along Montserrat, it would require two mid block crosswalks on Grandview Drive and Marion Drive. And with that, if, if council has any questions at this point, we can answer those, or if you'd like to take comments from the residents. Anything, Megan, for you to add, do you think, or is that? No, I think she covered it. Pretty much well. lay it out. And okay, so for, and I, I, I got a handle on this issue. Chris, do you have your pointer? I got a handle on this issue just um, last week. And as I understand it, so the sidewalk going around the outside is not an issue. Nobody's going to come in and raise an issue with that tonight, I don't believe. The issue is the sidewalk coming around in here, which would be one there and one here. And the, and the issue are these houses along Montserrat. Now, there is a bit of a, a, a unique situation with Montserrat that came up that I don't know is, you guys can talk, testify about whatever you want, I don't know how productive it will be to go down that road because this road, Montserrat, believe it or not, is part of Waterford. It's not part of mid-century. So there were some issues about these folks being given notice early on and when they knew and what they knew and whether they were part of the kind of the conversation, if you will, of mid-century and all of those issues. I, there's nothing we can do to turn back the clock and I don't know if there's anything to do about those notice issues impacting the substantive decision tonight. 
they may feel differently, and they're obviously free to, to testify how they wish. I, I, I hope I'm characterizing this accurately. And these, here's where the Mitchells live. Sue, I think you live there. And then there's one other people that live here. So it's just these houses on the inside of Montserrat. This is already in, or is in the process of being in. It's already in. It's already in. And this had been here for a long time, I believe, on mm -hmm. this side of Montserrat. And this had curbs and gutters because it came in with Waterford. However, they were crumbling and they were a mess. So we, we tore them out and replaced them, I guess. Um, so the issue is, and is in speaking with the Mitchells, and again, I don't want to speak for you, Greg, or Natalie, but they're okay with the sidewalk coming down. They would like it to come across their property with a crosswalk here to direct people that if you want to go around this way, you got to cross the street to get to this outside sidewalk. They want to remove just this portion. And I would imagine these people want to remove just this Actually, portion. Actually, no, they don't. They don't? Mm -mm. They don't want any on their property. I don't know about the people that are across here. from the Mitchell. I know. Well, that, I'll let them yeah. speak for themselves. I guess the folks on the corner. Are fine. So there would be no the lot. I guess the sidewalk on the inside would end here, and start here, and this around here would not be there. And then there would have to be a crosswalk here and a crosswalk there. I guess they can speak for themselves. Um, I just thought it would be very helpful if we laid this out and gave everybody put all everybody's thoughts in context here. Um, now there are several people that are signed in. You know, our rule, and we got this little lighting system up here. It's just like a traffic light. You got green, you got yellow, and you got red, and you got five minutes. Um, so we are usually pretty accommodating about what people want to say. You're here for us to hear. We're, you're here, and we're here for us to hear you. Um, I would just ask that you be respectful of the time limits, and also once someone has said something, I don't know how much of this testimony, I can't tell. I got four people on Montserrat, and I got three people that are not. So. Um, to the to the extent that your testimony is a bit duplicative, um, once we hear it, I don't know that we need to hear it multiple times. But I'm not about censoring anybody. So with that, does council have any questions before we? I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Um, Megan, if you could speak to the um, the notion of Waterford Village versus Mid Century. Um, was everybody given the same notice of the public meetings? And, the, and and what were, what were those notices that were sent? And did everybody get the same thing, or did the people in Waterford actually get excluded from our communication? The very, it's my understanding that the initial communication was directed towards the mid-century folks, and then once staff realized that there was actually a phase of Waterford that would be impacted by this project, then we started incorporating those properties into all the communications from that point forward. Okay, so the April of 2016 public meeting, do you know if they had? They were not included in that, but that I believe the, the August one? ones they were. Yes, that's correct. That's the very first meeting that was held according to our records. And we don't believe that the Montserrat Drive residents were included in that one. Okay, thank you. We good? Yeah. Uh, Greg Mitchell. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Peterson and Council. I do want to make a, a handout, which will kind of dovetail some of the comments already, if I might put some. So I guess to be official, the request would be for a waiver for sidewalks on the east side of Montserrat as part of this program under uh, the code section 152.048. Uh, the handout is pretty brief, and it does essentially corroborate uh, some of the things Michelle said and also a, a good summary from Mayor Peterson. Uh, and this first page is, in fact, the capital improvement program that was approved. Uh, Michelle's comments at the outset perfectly frame uh, the frustration for the water Waterford Village Association, and particularly uh, the four residents impacted. Not once did she mention Waterford Village. That's important. That's the same theme that has occurred from the outset of this program. 
Uh, as you can see, the capital improvement program specifically says mid-century neighborhood. You'll also note very specifically Montserrat Drive is not identified in that document. Second page is the letter that was provided to us on March 14, 2016. We did get a copy of this letter about the meeting. Notice two very important parts of this letter. Number one, the reference only to mid-century neighborhood street improvements. Number two, the fact that Montserrat Drive is specifically not identified on this letter. Therefore, no surprise that none of the four residents of Montserrat did appear. After all, we had caught wind that there was a project in the works. We were more than happy and felt uh, uh, that mid-century, whatever they were going to do to improve their program, more power to them. And we've never objected to that from day one. Uh, in fact, um, as Mayor Peterson correctly summarized, uh, on the north end of our property, which is actually, even though we're a Montserrat Drive address, we're on Longview, the north side. Absolutely no problem with the sidewalk there because we agree with the overall policy in the city of the con connectivity issue. What we do object to is the sidewalk on the east side. There is already a sidewalk on the west side of Montserrat. Uh, we think that clearly does not create any connect connectivity issues. Uh, our neighborhood, as you can tell, is a self-sustained neighborhood. There's no throughway. Uh, on the uh, bottom left-hand corner, you'll see two sidewalks that lead to the rest of Waterford Village. But there's no, thank you, there's no way to get through there with cars. So we have very little traffic on those streets. Um, frankly, we think that the inclusion of Waterford Village without any notice to us was an error, and the error continued to be perpetuated through meetings. Um, and through various communication. In fact, not until about six weeks ago did any resident of Waterford Village get any notice whatsoever of anything that was happening with the actual construction project. Moving forward then on your, on your uh, handout there, the third page is the title um, of the PowerPoint presentation that took place on April 12th. And for the first time, as a surprise to all of us, and candidly I think probably a surprise as far as we can tell to mid-century folks as well, Montserrat Drive is included. Uh, the next pages do create or uh, recreate rather a history, a bullet point history of the initial meetings. Noticeably absent again uh, on those summaries are any reference whatsoever to Waterford, uh, <clears throat> Waterford Village. After this meeting took place, my wife Natalie ha contacted the city engineering department. Mike Sweeter was nice enough to come out and show us the plans, and much to our surprise, that was the first time we actually officially knew Montserrat and Waterford Village was included in this program. Mike admitted to us himself he had no idea that Montserrat Drive was uh, not part of mid-century neighborhood. My wife then started with email correspondence with Councilperson Sale for what we thought was kind of unreasonable delays. Uh, we never got a formal, I, I should back up one second, after this uh, meeting and after our meeting with Mike Sweeter, all four residents that are impacted by this project submitted comment cards that we were told to submit by April 29th of 2016. All four residents submitted those. All four residents were consistent that we did not feel that the sidewalks were needed and in fact they were a waste of taxpayer money. Um, we never received a formal response to any of those comments. I have other uh, folks here from the west side of Montserrat who uh, obviously aren't as impacted since they already have the sidewalk. But uh, they, can, can, they also submitted comments and never received a response. We did have an in-person meeting in August with uh, Amy, Paul Hammersmith, and Mike Sweeter. At that meeting, in no uncertain terms, it was told to us uh, they have the right of way. They have the right to put in the sidewalks. This was not a discussion. This was not open to any amendment. This what was going to be done. Uh, I asked Paul specifically what, if anything, could be done and I will admit he did say only by waiver of counsel. Amy made it very clear she would not support uh, any amendment to the program at that point. And to be candid, we felt very uh, defeated at that time. Uh, I know I'm out of time. I'll finish up here. Fast forward to the construction project. Um, we are once again, as I said, completely out of the loop. We were never given any plans. We were never given any timeline, no chronology of what was going to happen and when. The only way we knew whether we could even get it out of our driveway or not is if we happen to uh, run into Scott uh, Sanders or, frankly, the construction guys to know what was going on. Not until an alternative 
issue came about, did uh, some communication <coughs> take place where Waterford Village at least uh, started to get notices uh, uh, to our homeowners association. The point is an error was made. Waterford Village was lumped into this program without our ability to have any input whatsoever. Um, when we tried to have a discussion or a discourse, we were summarily dismissed. As the frustrations grew, even with the construction project, I finally felt the need to reach out to Mayor Peterson. Uh, he graciously agreed to meet with me a couple weeks ago and uh, thankfully helped uh, give us time today. We don't think it's unreasonable to uh, fix these errors by simply a, a concession. Hopefully it would actually save tax taxpayer money on this point. Again, all four residents that are impacted by this submitted comment cards against this. We have uh, uh, two of the four are here today. Uh, one of the residents, um, Mr. Uh, Nash, is in Florida. Uh, I will admit at the meeting in August, he looked at the plans and agreed that they were uh, impressive looking plans, and we don't dispute that. Uh, but ultimately, he also conceded that he would go with the neighborhood uh, majority as far as what we decided. And again, the four of us uh, uh, have been consolidated of not wanting. We wanted to save our trees, too. Those have been ripped out, as was identified. But we feel that a concession to not put the sidewalks in is not unreasonable. And hopefully, it had the added benefit to also save taxpayer money. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Natalie Mitchell. I'm going to do my best to uh, not repeat what Greg said. I respect your time. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm trying to look at a couple of notes and, and go through this and pull out the things that he's already talked about. Uh, one of the things I would say is I actually have a text here from the Nash family. They actually did return today from Florida. And um, again, the comment to me was that, sorry, um, at that particular point in time, Mr. Nash, of the meeting in August of 2016, Mr. Nash had recently been diagnosed with a cancer um, and was frankly just at a point where he was tired and didn't want to fight and basically said, whatever my neighbors want, I concede to that. Um, he, he did say quality work is always done by Dublin and therefore he wasn't concerned that the project would look bad in the long run. However, they that family, as well as the Marians, which are on the other side of Longview to us, uh, they were both incredibly upset by the removal of the trees. I would say that everyone on Montserrat was incredibly upset by that. Obviously, we can't go back and get those back, but I just think that's an important note to make. Um, and and, and a, several of those residents did issue comment cards, which they got no response to in that regard. Um, I would also just want to say that you know one of the things that you know, all this boils down to um, opinion, personal preference, and, and really the interpretation of the code of what Dublin Standard is. And it's not personal. I, just like my husband and everyone else on Montserrat, we understand what mid-century Dublin was trying to achieve, and we applaud it. Uh, we supported it. Uh, but we just weren't part of it. And if you're going to talk about Dublin Standard, I mean, our own neighborhood, Waterford Village, isn't really up to Dublin Standard in many locations. For example, our, the two main streets on, in Waterford Village are Waterford Drive and Monterey. Both of those streets have part, well, one of those, Waterford Drive, has sidewalk on only one side. And it's my understanding that those very sidewalks that were put in on the north side of Waterford Drive were put in post this code getting into place. So I'm kind of curious and interested how that happened, why there was consensions at that point, but not for a dead end street. I don't, I, I can't comprehend that. Monterey, Monterey Drive actually is the street that connects a community library box, a public bench, and a park. But that section of Monterey does not have sidewalks leading up to our community park. None of the other streets, well, I shouldn't say none, most of the other streets in Waterford Drive don't have sidewalks on either side of the street. So, you know, if we're talking about Dublin Standard and what we're gonna do here, then we've opened the Pandora's box that Waterford Village is part of this, and I feel like Waterford Village should be afforded those same amenities then. Um, I'm sure you all know many of other locations in Dublin, and I, you know, could list some of those. Uh, Historic Dublin, River Forest, Dublin Manor, Dublin Estates, these are all places 
that aren't up to Dublin standards. My question to council would be, if, if we're trying to bring Dublin up to standards and mid-century Dublin is being afforded that, as well as apparently Montserrat and Waterford Village, is any community allowed to come in front of council and ask for taxpayer money and are they going to be given it? And if, if not, why is there preferential treatment for our area? And I'm saying that as a homeowner, I get that this increases the value of the area and therefore the value of my own home. But as a taxpayer, I'm just not comprehending this. Um, I'm just, let me look and see if there was anything else. I apologize. Uh, some of the things that I just would want to point out in the construction time frame. Uh, we, again, we were given no communication regarding the big picture or details of the construction timeline. That caused so many tensions to, you know, get people up in arms. It's, I mean, there were safety issues not adequately, adequately addressed. There were construction materials that apparently were being used that would harm our personal property, and we didn't have knowledge of that until after the fact. Um, it even caused some neighbors to use the double sidewalks that were pointed out earlier to use those as a way to leave the neighborhood because they had no other way. Um, unless, you know, of course, they didn't mind being late to every single thing they tried to get to. And actually, that very scenario is what caused Waterford Village and Montserrat to even get into the communication loop. Because as a result of those sidewalks being used by vehicles, it was Waterford's president who contacted city to find out what the heck was going on. And it was at that point that we found out, well, you're being communicated with, no, we're not part of mid-century Dublin. So the error just kept going on and on. Um, and then I'm just going to point out one other quick thing, and I'm hopeful that my neighbor who doesn't want to speak, because not real comfortable with these situations, somewhat like myself, um, will talk about the school bus issue. I mean, there, the very, idea of some of the reasons for sidewalks is safety of our children, certainly safety of all of us. But how this project could be partially, you know, utilized to say we need safe places for our children, yet we weren't more proactive in finding a suitable solution to address school bus routes. It was nearly not quite even 12 hours before a school day that we found out our kids were going to have to go through the construction zone in order to get to a bus stop much further away than what they normally go to. Um, and I will also happen to say, on a personal note, I found out the first actual communication that was directly given to Montserrat residents individually was on late afternoon of Friday, September 15th. A flyer was left in our mailbox. Um, I had previously scheduled contractors, small, small business people that were coming in to do, you know, some flooring and baseboard and painting in my house. And I was given like an hour and a half to scramble, scramble around, contact these folks and beg them to, you know, be flexible in their schedules for things that we had, again, scheduled months in advance and put them on their on hold too. So, you know, I could go on and on about all the impacts. I get it. Construction's never pretty and it's not perfect. But when you get, have to live through construction and have no idea what's going on, I think you can only imagine. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Natalie. Tina, is it Hankin? Welcome, Ms. Hankin. Thank you. I'm from the west side of Montserrat, so the impact is lower on me. Um, can you give us your address, please? Uh, 287 Montserrat. <clears throat> uh, in our case, we're really here to support our neighbors, but also to say, um, the only thing that we were asked, the only thing that we were told was we were asked if we wanted our trees taken out because the trees were going to be taken out on the other side. We were offered that opportunity. We said, no, we don't want them taken out. We love our trees. And along with that, we think that none of the sidewalk on Montserrat should be replaced. You mentioned that the curbs were old. Our side of the street, the curbs were new. They were about five years old. They were not old and crumbling, so they were recently replaced. None of that needed to be done. Now, all of that's been torn up and redone. Again, we can't go backwards. But we did send in comment cards and said that we thought that this was a waste of taxpayer money. There is virtually no foot traffic along our street, virtually no car traffic along our street, except during this construction time. Um, there's just no need for sidewalks on both sides, and it's a waste of, of money 
and it's silly to do. I won't go into the inconveniences and all of that, the lack of notice. Again, um, as the Mitchells mentioned, uh, the first we knew anything was happening, there was a tree cut down sitting in our driveway, literally across our driveway when we came home. The first we knew that the dr our driveway was going to be torn up was we happened to leave early enough and see that they were uh, tearing up the driveway down the street. We had no notification at all. I then contacted the city and we started getting notification, but if we hadn't happened to have left when we did, we would not have made it to work that day. So this whole project has been really bungled from the Montserrat perspective. It didn't need to be done. We support the uh, mid-century project, but Montserrat is not mid-century. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Inken. Uh, Frank Grundy? Grundy? Uh, I uh, agree with the Mitchells. Just uh, ditto the Mitchells? OK, thank you. Uh, Deborah Mitchell. Uh, my name is Deborah Mitchell, and I live at 178 Longview Drive, Dublin. Uh, I'd like to say that I have timed this talk, and it is within my time allotment. And also, I hope my voice hangs in there because I'm recovering from an illness where I lost my voice. So we'll see how I do. Um, to begin, I'm here as a board member of the Mid-Century Dublin Neighbors Association. My objective in speaking tonight is to provide council with an update from our neighborhood. Regarding first, the CIP project currently happening in Mid-Century Dublin, and second, the request as of September of 2017 made by one Waterford resident that new sidewalks installed as part of the CIP project be truncated at the end of each of our streets rather than be connected. For context and a brief reminder of how we got here, Mid-Century Dublin is a historic development, a collection of approximately 75 homes located just south of historic old Dublin, constructed primarily during the 1950s time period. Our neighborhood, made up of over 200 individuals, is truly multi-generational, with many elderly residents as well as families with young preschool and elementary age children. Our neighborhood association was formed in 2014 to strengthen, improve, and promote this area comprised of Grandview Drive, Longview Drive, and Marion Street, plus the connected portion of Franklin Street. In 2014, as part of the new association's agenda, we began a focused lobbying effort for capital investment by the city in our neighborhood. Because as of 2014, our tr streets had not seen significant repair or improvement in over 50 years. We lacked sidewalks, thereby restricting walkability and safe passage within the neighborhood as well as to downtown Dublin and other parts of the city. We also lacked other important elements of effective infrastructure, including curbs, gutters, and storm sewers for management of storm runoff. In the fall of 2015, City Council responded favorably to our request for infrastructure improvements. To maximize the value of this investment by the City of Dublin, Council required that the infrastructure improvements meet today's Dublin standards for new projects. Sidewalks on both sides of the street, as well as integrated curb, gutter, and storm sewers. In this way, expenditures by Council and the City of Dublin would be maximized in terms of their effectiveness. To ensure true safe connectivity as well as respond to the need for new curbs on nearby Montserrat Drive, which connects the streets of Mid-Century Dublin, the CIP project would include investment in Montserrat, specifically in terms of new curbs and street, as well as a sidewalk to run in front of four homes on the east side of Montserrat. While our original CIP request did not encompass these higher standards, I am here to report today that mid-century Dublin residents support these higher standards and are thrilled with the application of these standards, even while, of course, we are working to stay patient in the face of months of heavy construction, like dust and heavy equipment and long hours and so on. We wish to say to Council, thank you for your investment in our neighborhood and for insisting on it meeting the high Dublin standards that are commonplace in other projects of today. Our residents are incredibly happy and excited at the prospect of be being able to safely play, bike, and walk throughout our neighborhood and within our neighborhood, as well as by extension to the rest of Dublin. In addition, the market has recognized the value of this investment by council already. Property values of homes in our neighborhood have risen dramatically above the average of the rise in homes in the Dublin area since this project began. 
This partnership between Mid-Century Dublin and the City Council is an example of how wise investment in Dublin neighborhoods reaps benefits for current neighborhood residents, future neighborhood residents, and for the city as a whole. Wise investment reaps benefits much beyond the cost of the initial outlay. So this point relates to the second reason why I'm here tonight, and that is to provide our neighborhood view as to the suggestion by one Waterford household on record as of September 2017 that new sidewalks installed as part of the CIP project be truncated at the end of each of our streets rather than be connected as per the original concept, planning, and projected execution originated by the city engineering team more than 18 months ago. Simply put, our neighborhood wishes to reinforce City Council's original vision for this project. The quality and connectivity standards set by City Council must be maintained. If the East Montserrat sidewalk is not installed and instead mid-century sidewalks truncate at the end of each of our streets, we will not have safe connectivity and safe passage. For example, a child who lives on Longview near Montserrat will not be able to walk to the school bus stop without having to walk in the street. A child who lives on Marion near Montserrat will not be able to walk around to play with another child on Longview without having to walk in the street. In general, the whole goal of connectivity will be severely compromised. Not installing the sidewalk in question does not simply mean that children or the elderly will need to make a minor adjustment in their travel. It means a significant increase in danger. It means kids on bikes, elderly people using a walker or scooter, and others will still be in the road at times having to dodge traffic. In fact, when comments are made that those sidewalks or the roads are not well-traveled in mid-century Dublin and on Montserrat today, it is primarily because people are afraid of being in the street. This project and Council's vision has been meant to address that danger and that problem. Not installing the sidewalk on the east side of Montserrat means a significant compromise and a decrease in the overall value created by the project. When people speak of spending taxpayer dollars, it's not just the outlay, it's what we get for the outlay. And if that outlay is spent and yet the value is not captured, that is a waste of taxpayer money. To invest this much money in this project and yet only go part way and not all the way to ensure the value that was promised is a waste of taxpayer money. This would have a direct negative impact on home values and the value obtained by the city of Dublin. The request to eliminate the sidewalk is not supported by mid-century Dublin. In fact, it is not supported unanimously by all four homeowners who live on the east side of Montserrat. Comments have made, been made tonight about the homeowners who are not here tonight. It is a fact that they are not here, yes, but also it is a fact that they have not unanimously, as of September 2017, agreed with Natalie Mitchell and others that this should not happen. By and large, the two homeowners on the north and east side of Montserrat have said they do not oppose installing the sidewalk. That includes Cliff Nash, who was called out by name tonight. In closing, I'd like to sum up by saying two things to council. First, on behalf of the residents of Mid-Century Dublin, Thank you again for your outstanding high quality investment in our neighborhood. We are very grateful, not only for the funding, but also for the application of your high standards to the project. Secondly, please do not compromise safety, quality, and the value of this project by failing to install the sidewalk on the east side of Montserrat. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, Aaron Sheen. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Erin Sheen, 191 Longview Drive. Hi. I want to echo Deb Mitchell's appreciation for the massive improvements you made to our neighborhood. The sewers, curbs, and streets and sidewalks are so appreciated. I hosted a neighborhood cookout this weekend and spoke with several people who expressed similar gratitude. We discussed how amazing it is to already see children using um, the sidewalks for scooters, rollerblades, and bikes. And I personally am grateful that our students can walk from their bus stops to their home without being in danger of oncoming traffic. Because the, the city implemented an upgrade that is standard to similar upgrade projects in Dublin, it was determined that we would have sidewalks, sidewalks on both sides of our streets. I think having continuous sidewalks that provide safe connectivity to all parts of our neighborhood 
is the key to maximum utilization of the sidewalks and the bike path, as well as maximum safety benefits. I live next door to Greg and Natalie and I'm opposed to the idea of compromising the design of the project and failing to install the sidewalks on the east side of Montserrat. If the city decides to abruptly end the sidewalks on Montserrat, this would mean that my first grader could not safely walk home from her bus stop, which is located just north of the double sidewalks on Montserrat. If there are no sidewalks there, she has to walk in the street at an especially dangerous junction where people tend to go too fast on the turn from Montserrat onto Longview. Additionally, I'm opposed to the idea of making a decision to please the minority, which seems to be a few neighbors, as it would impact the entire neighborhood, the majority. I spoke privately with another neighbor on Montserrat who expressed their desire to have the sidewalks installed in a contiguous manner, as was originally planned. So I feel it's important to note that the desire, desire of the homeowners that spoke up tonight on behalf of ending the sidewalks doesn't necessarily represent the desire of everyone on Montserrat or all the people in the entire neighborhood. I ask that you please take the safety of all the neighborhood children who travel from Montserrat to Longview. Uh, keep that in mind as you make this very important decision and also ask that you continue with the original plan to extend the sidewalks on the east side of the street. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Bob Wisner. <clears throat> My name's Robert Wisner. <clears throat> And my wife and I have lived at uh, 140 Marion Street for 42 years. 42 years without, street, without streets, curbs, sewers, or, or uh, <coughs> sidewalks. And, but I want to say that we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And 42 of those years have been very happy as residents of Marion Street in Dublin, Ohio. Uh, we have a wonderful neighborhood. Our, front, our neighbors are very kind, friendly, and they take care of us. I'm 81 now, and I need care. But uh, we're, we want to stay there as long as we can, and we want to enjoy the neighborhood. And I wasn't aware that there was a bit, I was stepping into the middle of a big controversy here when I signed up tonight. <laughs> but but uh, I want to say, my purpose in coming here tonight was simply to express our uh, gratitude for the generosity and foresight that council and, and, the, and the staff uh, showed by giving us streets, sewers, and curbs, and so forth. It's just wonderful. I've been sitting out in my, in my uh, front yard watching the construction every day, and that's just been amazing. It's a first-class job. Dublin should, be, should uh, take great pride in what they've done for our, our neighborhood. Uh, my experience and observation in talking to my neighbors uh, is that the pride level of our residents has increased dramatically just in the last four weeks. I think the, uh, I wasn't aware that there was a big issue about sidewalks, but I think that uh, our experience, we have a 200 foot frontage. Uh, we have a, almost two acres on Marion Street 200 foot frontage and it's all sidewalk now. It's wonderful. Uh, we were not in favor of sidewalks, but we went along with it. And I think that that's probably one of the nicest aspects of the whole construction project because what's happened is I've started walking clear down to, <laughs> uh, clear down to, to uh, Dublin Road now because it's so nice to walk on the sidewalks. I have uh, seen neighbors and people walking back and forth in front of our house that I haven't seen in years, all because of the sidewalks. I think it's one of, that's one of the best features of it. Um, but the, so uh, my, I think I'm speaking on behalf of our neighbors and saying thank you very much for what you've done for our neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> the question in my mind, I'm a re retired attorney and my wife's a retired music educator, and our uh, perspective is, well, what can the residents of our community do to try and repay uh, the faith that you folks have put in us and into our neighborhood and, and the improvements? And uh, I've always been big on encouraging and promoting uh, community involvement uh, by residents, <clears throat> and uh, that's the way of paying back. Um, I'm 81, and I, I'm beyond the, my best years, so 
don't count on me to do that, but, <laughs> but I have a track record for being able to and, and promote and involve other people uh, in community activities. Uh, in 1977, I incorporated uh, and drafted the first constitution for the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. When I was president uh, the following year, I created the uh, uh, position of executive director. And uh, I found this young woman uh, who was raising a couple of young daughters at home, and I, in I invited her to, to accept the position of executive director. Her name's Margie Amaros, and I think she's still involved, isn't she? And so that's, uh, that, that's one contribution. Another one, real quickly, is in uh, 1990, I was president of the Columbus Metropolitan uh, Library Board of Trustees. That's the year we built the big new li library downtown, and I made sure that the city of Dublin got a new library. And I think you know the rest of the story now on that. So in conclusion, I, I just wanted, my purpose in appearing here today was just to express our sincere gratitude for your wisdom and, and uh, uh, generosity in giving us streets and everything else, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wissner. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Mr. Wissner, for letting me know how long I've known you, 42 years, <laughs> <laughs> playing with your daughter Becky in your front yard. Yeah, I didn't know why you wanted to admit that. <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> okay, so uh, is there anything you guys want? A couple of quick questions, though, that I would just add. The, the um, as, you know, one of the ways they sort of would have defaulted into notice is if there weren't right away on those lots. But there was right away, wasn't there, when Waterford was created? There was. So, and everybody else along all these other houses all eventually donated the right of way. Is that, isn't that right? All the right of way existed for this project. Okay. Um, so there was no kind of an appropriation action or anything like that necessary that would have notified them? We did have quite a few right of entries that we were able to obtain from property owners. And I need to ask Paul, who on Montserrat, do you recall? Uh, I think everybody. Everybody yeah. on Montserrat right granted a right of entry. Okay. And about this tree issue that I'm assuming that the street trees are going to be replaced with other street trees? Yes, yes. And our city forester, I believe, went out and assessed the condition of the trees. And there were quite a few trees that it was a good thing that they were coming out of as, as a part of this project. And we actually had some property owners that requested that we remove some other trees that were in the vicinity of those trees. So those discussions... I guess one thing I'd like to point out is just overarching timeline. We've, you know, there've been mention of some specific meetings and conversations over the past couple of years. All throughout the year of 2016, engineering staff and a consultant was designing the project. And that's a very iterative process. There was public engagement all throughout 2016. So the very first public meeting was in April and our engagement concluded in December of that year. So the, just as we do with any of our major projects, there's a lot of communication that occurs. There were individual conversations between Mike Sweeter, Paul Hammersmith, and other staff. Um, and th there's a lot of property owners in this neighborhood. And every single property owner had the opportunity to have a conversation with Mike Sweeter somewhere along the way in that process. So I just wanted everybody to have a, conver have a, a general overview of the timeline that it was ongoing for over a year. When did the surveying start? Surveying, surveying in the field or mm -hmm. surveying mm -hmm. staff? Yeah, surveying, I, I know that, that for the actual project, we had survey crews there and they were actually putting stakes in the ground and marking things. I don't have that date with me, but typically that's early on in design. Paul, do you happen to have that date with you? early 16 sometime. Yeah, because um, I know that um, the folks that um, were saying they didn't get notice um, had said to me at this meeting in August at the Mitchells that they got this letter from the city and it was addressed I think to mid-century Dublin or you know the the Dublin neighbor at whatever their address is and they just thought oh it's the mid-century project and they didn't really pay attention to it and so it wasn't that they didn't get notice it just they weren't 
dialed into what was going on, but there were in fact, you know, survey crews out there marking um, the street trees. Um, I had a conversation with Paula Chope, I think as did a number of people um, from the city and from the neighborhood about the street trees, um, in particular on the east side of Montserrat. They were crabapple trees that were 20-ish years old, and they were very close to the end of their life anyway. Um, they looked really pretty for about a week every year uh, when they were in bloom, and then the rest of the year they didn't, they, they were not healthy, and that they, pro and Paula shared that this was something that, you know, they would be replacing those trees anyway, as we do. Um, I, I guess um, I was um, referred to in the, uh, that, that I, I didn't, um, that I, you know, shut down the residents. And, and actually what happened at that meeting, um, three residents came, um, the Nashes, the Marions, and we were at the Mitchells' house. And um, Natalie was very upset. The Mitchells were very upset about the idea of having sidewalk in front of their home. And um, Ms. Mitchell asked me, do, I don't want to, she said, I want to fight this, but I don't want to waste my time. Do you think it, you know, it's, it's a waste of time? And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't support your effort. You've got all these homes. I'm picturing the folks on Grandview Drive, Longview Drive. Um, you know, as a young mom, I would ride, um, you know, push a stroller, and my daughter would ride the bike in front of us, and we would go around on the sidewalks in our neighborhood. And I'm picturing getting up to, you know, the top of Grandview Drive on our, you know, if I lived on that side of the street, I would get up to the top of the hill where Montserrat starts, and I'd have to cross the street to continue the bike ride. I just thought, this is crazy. Um, and I told her I did not support that effort, and I didn't think that, you know, but I was one of seven. You know, anybody's welcome to come to council and make any requests they want. Um, certainly we listen. Um, but I said, you know, I'm not supportive. I think that this is going to be a great project. I think that, you know, the idea of sidewalk in front of your house, is it different? Yes, it's different. Um, but I think overall it's going to increase property values. But, you know, I was thinking about the young parents, and I was thinking about we have a, a home um, on um, Longview where senior citizens live. And if they're able to get out and walk, I can only imagine that that would be great for them. But, you know, getting up to the top of the street, you know, as Mr. Worcester sh share, Mr. Worcester shared, um, it's connectivity. Um, it's a wonderful thing. And, you, you know, you realize how nice it is to have sidewalk once you have it. Um, it is going to improve property values. But um, long term, big picture, and that's what I think we're tasked with um, when we sit in these chairs up here. Um, you know, we need to look at the, the community as, um, as it goes on. Years are going to go by, and if we were to grant the request, um, take out two or four of the houses, um, you know, people move on from their homes. They, um, you know, in a lot of cases, folks raise their families and they find someplace else to live, and I think of the next young family that moves into that house, and they're going to come to this room, and we're probably not going to be here, most of us, and they're going to say, um, there's sidewalk in every other part of my neighborhood, but I don't have sidewalk in front of my house. Can you please put sidewalk in? Why in the world? How did this happen? Um, and, and so, um, you know, we've seen that happen um, just in the 15 and a half years I've been here. You know, we've allowed certain neighborhoods or streets or areas to be excluded from projects only to find out that the folks that were most passionate about it, you know, moved to another state. Um, you know, within the year, and it's frustrating because it's like, oh my gosh, we we did that, and it wasn't the right decision um, to, you know, put put some put something in the way of a of a big project like this. Um, I think that you know we have to think of that long term big picture. We have to think of those parents. We have to think of those elderly folks. We have to think of those future homeowners that are going to want sidewalk. Um, it's it's you know short term pain for a long. Um, long-term gain and I think once everybody gets the sidewalk in and the streets you know they the grass is replanted it recovers the trees get in they grow a little bit um, this is going to be you know a more beautiful neighborhood than it already is and more importantly it's going to be connected and built to Dublin standards and I think for me you know when somebody asked the question I think it was a rhetorical question you know if another neighborhood came in and asked the city to do this are we going to do it 
you know, yeah, I hope the answer would be yes. If we have the ability to upgrade a neighborhood, to connect a neighborhood, to put storm sewer where it belongs, to put, you know, wider streets where a garbage truck and a school bus will be able to pass side by side without trauma, um, and, and, you know, connect a neighborhood with sidewalks, I, I hope the answer would be yes. Um, that's, that's why we're here. Make neighborhoods better. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Any other? Comments or questions from council staff have anything else? Council? Further comments. Comments from council. All right. Oh, I have one question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so there was mention of construction materials that would harm property. Quint, does some anyone know what that is? Do you know? Yeah, what what was that all about? Um, yeah, please, so that we can have it recorded. Apparently there was something called cement powder and I don't cement understand. Cement powder? Cement powder. 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 Yeah, something in the process of after um, all of the concrete had been pulled back and the dirt was down, they put some sort of material that would lay up to allow the next layer to go in. Um, and apparently it will harden on your car, on the underbody of your car. Oh, on your car. Soil car. stabilizer. I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Sorry. The yeah. cement so, stabilization. Yeah, soil stabilizer. So. Those of us on Montserrat obviously were not aware of it until word of mouth after the fact. Was there damage done to automobiles? I, I am not. Well, one person said that she had, but she's not here, so I won't speak on her behalf. Okay. So, All right. Thank, thank you. you for clarifying that. That was helpful. Oh, sorry. Since I have it, I just want to clarify. I am a parent, and I chose that home. So I would think that if a young couple or family was looking and they didn't, you know, like that there weren't sidewalks on the one side of the property, they could choose another location. Perhaps. Okay, thanks. That was the one question I wanted to have some clarification on. Uh, Megan, when this project was was bid, uh, you have the ability to deduct linear footage. Uh, it was a, I, I believe I recall reading through that document, and it was a lump sum. Um, we are able to non-perform specific work items. This is a unit price contract, so there's line items that we're able to non-perform if needed. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from council? Jim? I just want to comment that, um, you know, I'd venture to say that any of us that have served here for any length of time, um, you know, have faced situations like this. Most often uh, it had to do with bike paths. Um, you know, whether it was along the side of somebody's house, the back of somebody's house, the front of somebody's house. Um, and, and in no case did we ever make light of the concerns that were expressed. Um, but I think the view was what's best for the community, um, not only presently, but long term. And I have to say in, in um, every instance that I'm aware of that I can recall, um, the some of the folks, no, all of the folks that initially expressed concern um, did not express concern, you know, shortly after the project was, was ultimately completed. So, um, you know, again, that's not to, it, it, there, this represents change, um, and, and in no way am I making light of the concern expressed by the individuals that spoke this evening. Um, you know, but as my colleague uh, Ms. Saley stated, you know, I think we need to take a long-term view here. Um, and we have this policy of connectivity. You know, some examples were given of, of, of uh, Monterey in Waterford Village, for example, and some other neighborhoods. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that those streets were constructed um, before our present policy. Um, and if we were going back in, uh, you know, to do work, you know, that um, everything else being equal, that we would construct sidewalks on both sides of the road. So, and Tim, to your point, I believe that some of those along Franklin Street just went in our CIP with uh, some uh, sidewalk upgrades and, and things like that. So I, I, to your point, I believe that some of them are um, already in the C, programmed in the CIP to receive the enhancements. And that was based on a request by a resident. That's all, thank you. 
anything else? Uh, well, you know. Mayor, Mayor Peters, I'm sorry. Uh, this happens, especially since it was alleged that we were being apparently the only road people on each side that want Belmont to sidewalks and figure out where the sign is. I'm a bit late. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then. Uh, No, all you got to do is talk. I'm Sue Cavanagh, 338 Montserrat Drive. And I don't have anything else to add other than that I support their decision. The sidewalks do. We did as well by our house. We have three boys. We cut down our first base tree. They were very upset about that. And we were impacted by the transportation that was um, arranged. But we did have that mitigated successfully. Um, but it's been a challenge. And, and we do support not putting in the sidewalk, but um, that's where I'm going to leave it. I Could I ask just why, specifically why you don't want sidewalks? I, I mean, I've heard a lot about the, the issues and the problems in communication, and, and I certainly appreciate that you guys are coming and talking with us about that. The way that we get better as a city and the way that we well, get better as staff is to hear comments that. Specifically like that. for me, yeah. I don't see it as a connectivity issue. My kids have to cross the street regardless to get on the bus. So there's going to be some type of cross-traffic situation. Anybody that lives on any of those streets that are coming down Longview has to cross Montserrat to get to the bus stop. So they're always going to be some type of street crossing. Maybe not always, but in most cases, yes. So the safety of my kids is my paramount concern, sure. but they still have to cross the street because our bus stop is on the other side. So you don't my think, sidewalk situation mm -hmm. is it's our yard. When we purchased our home, we did not have sidewalks. We had beautiful trees. We use them as bases. My kids are very active. They are not the electronics kids of today. They're outside, they're playing, and right now they're playing in construction. And that's temporary, I understand, but our yard is gonna be significantly reduced in size. And you know, maybe our football field isn't going to be as successful, or our baseball bases aren't going to be as great. And they're running in the yard, they're gonna have people on the sidewalks, potentially traffic on the sidewalks, or an opportunity to fall on the sidewalk, whereas they're falling in grass now. So. I mean, that's that's where we're at. We purchased our home the way it was, and that's that's kind of how we'd like it to be. Sure, but you also purchased your home knowing that there was a right of way there for the yes, purpose I acknowledge of, of that. public I acknowledge that, improvements. Um, so I guess I'm curious to understand, do you think there's a difference between crossing the street at a bus with flashing lights telling other cars that are required by state law to stop versus crossing the street where no one's required to stop at the point where someone's crossing the street? I guess so I see a difference there. already. So my elementary students. I understand. I think the sidewalks the bus, are the in middle school students cross on their own mm -hmm. with no bus and are expected. So my kids go from our house on Montserrat. They cross the street mm -hmm. and walk down to where it says drive in Montserrat and catch gotcha. the bus there. So and there is no person flagging them or mm -hmm. bus lights or anything. They're on their own. Actually, they're able to walk down the sidewalk. Um, they still have to cross the new the sidewalk street. and they cross, still have to cross with, the street cross without the signal bus of, signaling. No, That's you would true. walk down the street, cross the street at the signal of the bus driver. No, right now my child catches the bus where it says drive on the other side of Montserrat. They have right. to cross the street, and right, but they'll walk on sidewalk now, and they'll be able to go and wait for the bus driver. Wait till the stop arm comes out, and they can cross That's at the driver's not what was signal. Communicated to us, so I didn't. It, I, yeah. I, I'm at sorry, that's point, how bus stops work. So yeah, yeah th that will be. So that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. My child rides the bus every day, and there's nobody flagging him across the street. Okay. That's the, I know. That I'm you, telling you. Yeah, I know. I get it. Current situation. I so totally get it. If that's going to be in the future, and they can get on a bus safely, and somebody's going to flag every child across. No, no, that's not what she's saying. What she's saying is the way that it's supposed to work is your child is supposed to wait on their side of the street until the bus stops. When the arm of the stop sign comes out and the bus driver waves them, that's when they're supposed to cross the street. Right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they'll be able to walk on sidewalk right. down to, it's Longview and Montserrat is the, is the stop? The stop is at... She's saying the stop is right there. Right there, but it's across the street. All the kids are supposed to be at the stop. There's no mention of staying across the street. There's kids coming from Longview on both sides. There's kids coming from Montserrat, and there's kids coming from the other direction as well. We're all supposed to be at that stop when the bus arrives. That's okay. my understanding. No, so you're, if I'm you're, misinformed, then that's... Yeah, your your student's place of safety is actually on your resident side. 
um, it's awkward because there's Not no sidewalk. Not a single sidewalk. person in our neighborhood waits on the other side of the street. All okay. the kids are on the other side. Well, there is very little traffic in our neighborhood yeah. aside yeah. from the construction well, at this point. You know, I've been doing this for 34 years, 20 years as a township trustee and 14 years on, on the city. And there's nothing that people are more passionate about than their real estate. I can't tell you the number of cases over 34 years that I've heard. And I get it. I understand it. We had a case uh, on Brand Road where a couple of the residents were absolutely livid and uh, did not want this, one of which came to me afterwards and said, I would never admit it, but it's one of the best things that ever happened to us. We actually are connecting, echoing Mr. Wisner's remarks. We're seeing our neighbors that we never saw. We have a place to walk and to get to. And uh, there's more communication within the, within the neighborhood, and they love it now. That has been repeated time and time again with our bike path uh, and our connectivity issue. So I get it. I mean, as I said, I, I, I've I never seen that anything that more passionate than people with their own real estate. But I and this is one of the hardest that... parts of this job right here is trying to separate. Nothing I hate more than to see a divisiveness in a neighborhood. Hopefully, uh, you know, we can get beyond that. But yeah. thank you. Thanks. Okay. Anything else from council? All right, so I guess the, the uh, Mitchells and the people on Maserat, Montserrat on the east side would be requesting a waiver, and is there a motion in a second to waive that sidewalk connectivity uh, that we all know what the issue is now? Hearing none, I guess that will be the end of the issue. The project will go forward as it's currently set. So, moving on with the rest of our agenda. The consent agenda, there are one, two, three, four, five items on the consent agenda. Is there any uh, council member that would like to remove any one of those five items? Hearing none, I make a motion that we approve the all five items on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Ann? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Second reading, public hearing on ordinances, ordinance 59-17. and Rezoning approximately 2.4 acres from BSDP, Bridge Street District Public to BSDHD, Bridge Street District Historic Transition for two lots within the historic district located at the northwest corner, the intersection of North High Street and North Street. Jenny. Good evening. Um, I have no changes from when council heard this um, at the first reading. Uh, rec we're recommending um, approval of this rezoning. Any questions or comments from council? Hearing none, Ann? Uh, Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Saluto? Yes. Ordinance 63-17, Ann? Accepting the annexation petition for 2.9 more or less acres from Washington Township to the city of Dublin. Michelle? Yes, no changes since the first reading of this ordinance. Uh, this is for a property located at 7026 Shire Rings Road. We are recommending approval of this ordinance this evening. This property is within the proposed annexation area of the community plan and is located in the exclusive Dublin service area. Uh, staff therefore recommends approval of this. Uh, this is also one of the islands, as we call them, within the city that uh, is within Washington Township, but completely surrounded by the corporate limits that has been a long-standing policy of council to try and accept these annexations when we can. Any questions from council? Right, they answered all of mine at the last reading. Thank you. Ann? Ms. Saley? Yes. Uh, Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Ludo? Yes. First reading on ordinances, ordinance 64-17. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a health services contract for 2018 with Franklin County Public Health. Michelle? Yes, this is a renewal of our contract with Franklin County General Health District. This uh, shows a 5% increase over the 2017 per capita rate. The new per capita rate is $8.28. <laughs> Based on Morphsey's recently revised estimation population for Dublin, which has us at 47,326 residents, the city's cost for the 2018 contract is $391,859. Uh, 
Uh, staff is recommending that council approve this ordinance at the second reading on October 9th. Just one final note, as council's aware, this does not include our mosquito control and management program, which is a contract, a separate contract with Vector Disease Control and Franklin County Public Health. Questions from council? Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I'll go on record as introducing this ordinance. Sure, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions, just as I'm not familiar, very familiar with the plumbing end of this. Um, so it, it appears that, that they're going to, they do all of the plumbing inspection services and we reimburse them uh, a percentage of the fee, inspection fee. That is correct. Up to it's sixty percent of the fee goes back to Franklin County, and that is not it. That's not a fixed number. I see on the um, on the ordinance itself, there's no pricing included on the ordinance. So is it just a? Uh, it's adjustable then, depending on how many inspections occur. I am not sure as to that. So uh, we may get back to you at the at the second reading the with second that information, reading. if that's okay. That'd be wonderful. Check on that. um, And I think that was that was my only question. Thank you. Okay, we'll revisit on October the 9th. Uh, ordinance 5065-17, Ann. Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2017. I'll reduce it. Thanks, Tim. David. Good evening, members of council. Ordinance 65-17 would amend the 2017 appropriations. The most significant adjustments are related to capital projects previously approved by council. Detail for each appropriation is included in the documentation. Staff requests council approve this ordinance at the October 9th meeting, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Questions from council? Uh, I have one question. Um, for... Uh, when there is not offsetting revenue to some of these funds, it looks like perhaps the um, Bridge Street District, there's no offsetting revenue. When do those uh, guaranteed service payments, when will those begin? The minimum service payment guarantee under the Crawford Hoy Development Agreement actually starts in 2018. We set up specific TIF funds for that, so we brought forward subsequent TIFs that were established. So all the expenses related to that, so related to the two parking structures and the street network, are hitting those accounts, and then the revenue will come in to offset that. Okay, but we won't see that till 18, you said? Correct. Okay. Um, do we have any other funds that uh, that we don't have offsetting income for? No, typically the only time that that occurs is the first year or two of a new TIF that's been established just because property taxes or payments in lieu of taxes are collected a year in arrears. Okay. It usually takes some time to catch up. Thank you. Is that it, Chris? Any other questions? Okay, we'll see you back on October 9th on that. Public hearing on resolutions, resolution 69-17. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the Holder Wright Park Development Project. I'll reduce, reduce it. Matt. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, this is a park development project for Holder Wright Earthworks site. Um, it is the second phase of this project according to the Capital Improvement Program. We originally bid this project in 2016, at which time the bids came back well above the engineer's estimate, as well as the budget. Um, have to give kudos to Sean Korwetsky, our landscape architect, who went back with the design consultants and um, a couple of different creative ways to rebid this project. Uh, we reopened a new bid um, in August of this year. Uh, the bid came back very uh, comparable to the estimates and the budget. Uh, we have budget, or we have the budgeted funds for this project currently. Uh, we are pleased with the results in that we've received seven comparable bids. Uh, Thomas and Marker construction was the lowest and best bid of those seven, so we are recommending approval of Resolution 6917. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions from Council, Chris? I have two questions. Uh, one. What is the specialized form liner concrete work? That is the actual restroom design itself. It's gonna re require some custom form liners. It's a curvature type of um, circular type of building. Um, so it's not your typical 90 degree angle 
and straight walls. So there will be special forms. Okay. Um, and is there going to be any access to the ravine on the south side of this property ultimately planned for this park? The entrance to this park will actually be on the south side of the ravine with the parking lot and restrooms and plaza on that side with the bridge going across. Across the ravine. Mm -hmm. Will there be any access planned for? There currently the status with, with all of the invasives and so forth that are along that stream corridor, we are going to be cleaning that up, which will provide some access down there, but we'll have to do some rehabilitation as well to get the riparian zone repaired and back to the, the state that which we are preferring it. I think this might be one of the new favorite parks of people in our community once they see um, the topography back through there and I think it'll it'll compete with um, the North Fork there and, and other parcels where there is just a remarkably beautiful ravine and um, a lot of history there. So that's Yeah, that, this park is going to be very exciting, very unique to the community. A lot of interpretive abilities through natural formations, through history and uh, and the like. So there's, there, we're planning a lot of interpretive type of programming for this park. Were we able, were we ever able to secure any of the artifacts from those, um, from the caves there in, in that ravine? To my knowledge, the artifacts that exist are in multiple places, some of which are privately um, secured. We don't know exactly if they have what they have, but we hear things. Historical Society, Ohio, um, Ohio uh, Historical Society also has several artifacts, as does OSU. Um, Ohio State University has done on several archaeological digs out there to ensure the preservation of anything that might be disturbed during the construction. And Mrs. Holder's house, that's going to that's going to be utilized yes. on some level. Yeah, it was renovated in 2014, I believe. Uh, we're going to do some additional work to that to make sure that it offers some unique opportunities for interpretive programs and tours and things. I think it'd be really neat if our historical society perhaps took up the charge to secure some of those artifacts that maybe could be displayed in Mrs. Holder's old house there and uh, really give you a sense of, of that area I think would be. We've been working cool. with the Holder family quite closely and we've got a very significant inventory of items that exist. Um, they still have those items but um, I think I have a couple arrowheads. From it's, <laughs> it's our intent to secure as many of those in the inventory for the city as possible. Yeah. That's, it's going to be a special park. I'm really excited. It's been a long time coming, but it's really going to be fantastic, I think. Those, Thank those you. are the caves that Randy Roth would take new council folks to, and you weren't sure if you were going to come back or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's going to start in the fall, Matt? Construction? Yes, it will, it, will, it, it, will, it will begin rather quickly. And how long do you think mm -hmm. it will take to get it wrapped up? It'll probably take a year. Uh, we're hoping to open that park by next fall. Great. Fantastic. Anything else, Chris? Questions? Okay. No more questions? Uh, okay. Anna? Uh, Ms. Saley? Yes. Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Ludo? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Resolution 70-17? Accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission, authorizing the necessary tax levies, and certifying them to the county auditor. I'll reduce it. Thank you, Tim. Angel? Good evening, members of council. Each year we are required to bring for, forward to council for approval the rates um, for our property taxes. So specifically, we're looking at the portion of the inside millage, the inside 10 mills that the city receives. We receive 1.7 mills. As part of the 2018 through 2022 CIP that you approved last council meeting, we had allocated 1.4 mills to the capital improvement tax fund and the remaining 0.35 mills to the parkland acquisition fund. This ordinance simply solidifies that and we will pass it along to the county budget commission uh, once it's approved by this body. Questions from council? I think it's very germane that this follows what we just heard about this parkland that we're developing and I I, I want to go on record that I understand we can move money around, that we can, that we have the ability to pull from, if our, our parkland fund, we can purchase parkland out of funds other than what uh, is in the parkland fund itself. Um, but I would like us to see, I would like to see a return on our part to maybe not the 100% uh, that we did prior to uh, 2006. Um, 
But we've done an 80% reduction in our parkland acquisition fund in percentage-wise uh, in the course of 12 years. And I, I don't know that 100 is the right number, but um, I think when we start identifying parcels, one of the first questions we always ask ourselves is how much money is in the parkland fund? Um, and if the parcel is of more significant expense than what's in the fund, then we have more work to do than uh, if we have that money simply sitting in the parkland fund. So I don't take exception with this because I know that we have a lot of capital improvements projects to fund. But I would like to see us return at least partially back to um, a more significant amount of this tax revenue going directly to the park fund so that when we have those opportunities, um, it isn't any more difficult than it has to be to make those decisions. Yeah, there'll be a chance to talk about that when we get into budget hearings in November. So, Well, that actually becomes as part of our capital budget discussion because, for example, um, in this CIP, Three point, almost $3.2 million because of this allocation is going to the capital fund. And if you recall, at the end of our five-year CIP, we had a very little positive variance left. So to the extent that we take any of that $3.2 million and put it in parkland acquisition, completely acceptable, we need to make that decision or be aware of that, have that discussion as part of the CIP because to take out $3 million or any part of that cumulatively over a five-year period would have dramatic impacts on what we can then accomplish in the capital. But it's certainly And that's precisely why I don't take exception with right. this. Just moving forward, I'd like to see that contemplated when we make those financial decisions. So I think it's a great note for next year, Angel, to have that as part of the CIP discussion so that we don't lose sight of it. Well, and we try to incorporate it, but we will make sure we emphasize it more. Next we've, year. we've never shorted the residents uh, on parkland. Uh, I, I there's did not always been a way to pay for it. And, and really, for me, um, it's the flexibility issue. We have the money there to do uh, with it as we, as we see fit, as council dis determines. So um, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think it's semantics at the end of the day, and it's always better to have more flexibility. I'm certain uh, Angel would agree with that as a finance director, that to have flexibility is always important. So, In the spirit of our political climate, I will respectfully disagree and be completely supportive of respectful dialogue and disagreement. <laughs> well said. Excuse me, Angel. Yes. Um, w w w would it be fair to say that, that this dovetails to a degree with um, uh, our recently updated understanding your local taxes uh, explanation? Um, we don't go into this level of detail, really. I, I do believe that we address the allocation, how much we put in parkland acquisition, how much we don't, how much goes to capital, um, mainly because that residence guide to understanding taxes, when you start getting in to talk about millage and inside millage, it becomes very confusing very quickly. So we, if there's a piece in there. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should go down into that kind of detail. I mean, that's certainly available to residents right. if they want to. I, I apologize. Maybe I didn't frame the question correctly. Um, if, if we took the cumulative result of what you're showing us here, that would be reflected in the understanding of your local taxes yes. that, that indicates what portion of your property taxes goes to the city, yes, which I, is 2% and correct. according to that revised document on a $300,000 home, that equates to $204 per year. That is correct and I'm sorry I didn't understand your question that's and okay. I think that that's an important point. We have the benefit that we don't have to use any of our property taxes generated for general operating expenses. They are used for capital projects, be it parks or other capital projects, but that's correct. One Thank thing you. I'd like to see is the, uh, I ask for this every year, but you got the estimate of the full tax, the millage. I'd like to see the actual millage rate, just uh, informationally in next, next, next meeting. If I could ask. We act, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, on the police, uh, it actually comes out to 0.194622. It's in that point one. Yeah, and I wanted to point. It's not 1.2 mils. It's it's been reduced right. over the many many years that levy's been on to 0.19. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm curious if the um, the debt for the Metro Park purchase. When does that roll off? Or did this it year, already? our $385,000 payment ends this year, 
And then the only other debt service we have that is funded through the, through the Parkland Acquisition Fund is for Kaufman Park. Mm -hmm. That is around $240,000 a year and ends in 2020. So that 385 could potentially also go back into Parkland. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Ann? Ms. Saluto? Yes. Ms. Sale? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Sam Rose Grooms? Yes. Before I turn the page, are you guys a government class? Are you allowed to leave at 830? I, I says you can, you can. I say you can. You, we'll take a uh, two-minute break so you guys can. Bring your forms up. We're going to sign for you. Yeah. Deal with and then. Uh, so, resolution 71 17. Yeah? Accepting the historic and cultural assessment of the built resources, landscape features, and archaeological sites within the entire Dublin planning area and a list of preservation strategies appropriate to Dublin. I'll reduce it. Thank you, Tim. We, we have uh, Joanne Shelley here this evening with our planning division to do an overview of this assessment. Thanks. Good evening, members of council. Um, I just wanted to recognize that in addition to myself, 
Um, J.M. Rayburn was very instrumental in working through all of the activities associated with doing this a cultural assessment and um, working closely with our consultant, who is Anne from Hardline Designs, who's here this evening to give you a short presentation. Uh, the The um, purpose of the cultural assessment was that ARB requested additional information as we went to update the historic district uh, guidelines and codes. Um, so updating the Ohio Historic Inventory, evaluating other relevant historic stru structures within the city, looking at preservation efforts for property owners and how they could be funded. Um, and assessing contributing and non-contributing buildings to ensure that we are preserving buildings that are actually contributing to our historic character and in general to provide us with historical assistance. The final materials are now available on our website and it's a report with the recommendations. There's a detailed appendices of all of the properties that were assessed um, with a plethora of uh, information. If you're interested in history, this is a excellent uh, guide to historic Dublin and the history that's happened here. And this always also includes all of the GIS data sets which were um, imported into our GIS system. Um, prior to this resolution being be brought before you, it was brought to ARB and also to the Planning and Zoning Commission for their review and comment. At the end of the presentation, we'll ask you to accept the resolution um, to accept the cultural assessment. And Anne is here from Hardline Designs to uh, walk you through the process. Good evening. Uh, Hardline's design was the prime on this. Commonwealth was the uh, sub. Essentially, I'm going to skim over everything um, in terms of methods and research design and kind of get to the meat of the results. The scope was the 34 square mile planning area of uh, Dublin. So whether or not it's in your jurisdiction, we looked at 34 square miles that covers over three counties. As Joanne mentioned, uh, the objective was to figure out what historic resources exist here, prepare a detailed inventory and update what you already had and add to it. Uh, and then look at what key elements of those resources would contribute to Dublin's historic and very unique character in the central Ohio area. And then, of course, to provide the resources to city planners. So we investigated, after building our list of resources, 897 buildings over 50 years old in the area. All of those are in the appendix. Four bridges and culverts over 50 years of age. Uh, nine cemeteries, not all of which we could verify. Uh, we ended up with 54 stone walls that are still in existence, although we looked at 72 that had been documented. Looked at five potential mill locations, six potential quarry locations, which are important because that's where all the stone for your lovely stone walls come from. And we also went and did a field verification on 359 archaeological sites that are within that 34 square mile area. Out of that, we evaluated of particular interest, your buildings and structures according to nationally recognized standards. Kind of give us a lingua franca for uh, looking at this. We came up with uh, 23 buildings that we think are individually eligible on their own merits for the National Register. 17 buildings that we think are probably eligible but require a little bit more research. And then of course we came up with three new historic districts that were recommended eligible. Uh, one of which is pending some additional research came up with, uh, let's see, is this, no. But it was Indian Run, which is just north of downtown. It was designed by local architect Bob Royce and his son Dick Royce. Uh, Bob designed the Drexel and Bexley. It's a subdivision plotted in 1957. His family lived there. Um, grandchildren still own a property there. Uh, but it is a, a great example of a mid-century subdivision designed by one noted local architect. Uh, we also had one, Frank Dublin Heights, which now we're kind of thinking there's a few properties in and out of it, but is another mid-century. And then something that's outside your jurisdiction in Jerome Township is um, the Fraser Estates, which we believe, based on 
the limited amount of research we were able to do, it's a mid-century uh, subdivision that may have been specifically developed for African Americans leaving central um, Columbus. So if that proves out, it would be actually be a fairly significant um, subdivision. So the Dublin district, as you know it now, this map's a little small, but your red square over there is your existing historic district. The purple line is what we recommended it should be expanded to. And one of the reasons was we said the period of significance or the, the historical period should go from the earliest building of 1820 up to mid-century, 1966, when your historic character begins to change and become a little bit more um, common with the building of 270. So if you look at the northern part, you can kind of zoom in on that. It would end up including 93 contributing buildings, and that means that they lend themselves to um, telling the story of the district. And uh, one cemetery, the bridge, the spring, a quarry, a possible mill location, and of course all of your stone walls would go into that. If you zoom in on the south side, it's kind of looking at the south part. One thing I would note on this map and other data is any building that's newer than 50 years old, not highlighted on here. So it looks a little bit more um, cohesive than you might be if you put in little black dots for all of the other buildings. But that's typically how districts are defined. In addition to that, we came up with six other resources or groups of resources that really do contribute to Dublin's unique character and sense of place. This includes things like the farmsteads at Glacier Ridge Metro. Um, and then we looked and verified seven of the nine cemeteries we could figure out came up with a couple of others we couldn't actually verify, given the scope of our project. Um, as some of you may be aware, you actually do have one of the early quarries in the city inside a metro park, or inside a park at Donegal Cliffs, the Snaufer Quarry number three. Then we also verified the probable remnants of one of the earliest mills, the Joshua Corbin Stone Mill and the Mill Race out in the Scioto River. There's another one I understand is still up by the Dublin Arc, Arts Council building, but we didn't have access to that private property to get in and verify it. And there's several others where we, we have general locations where we think they are, but we just, it was outside our scope to actually do any more investigation. But they're there for planning. Uh, we looked at a list of 72 stone walls. Um, these grew out of an earlier list. We were able to say that there's 55 in existence in this planning area. We didn't include new builds. We didn't include things within housing developments. Um, we started with the main uh, roads, the ones along the main roads that had been in the list. And we were able to quantify them somehow into uh, the traditional dry laid stone walls, which have a couple of different uh, building methods, and then also atypicals and then new builds. So there's a whole appendix of your, your walls if you want to look at those in any detail. Um, and we also identified or called out two significant prehistoric archaeological sites, one of which you've already talked about here tonight, the Wright Holder Earthworks. The other is just slightly outside your planning area, but Davis Mound. It's uh, one of the reasons why we went and looked at it is uh, because of where it is on the landscape in the driveway. At some point in the future, you're probably going to have an erosion problem with it, and also because of a tree there. So we did come up with a fairly large list of recommendations. These are the boiled down primary ones. Um, first off, consider adding some of the properties that we've recommended as individually contributing or individually eligible to the National Register or contributing to a historic district to the ARB process and giving them special consideration during planning department review of projects. Consider completing a formal update and amendment to your existing Dublin High Street historic district in consultation with the State Historic Preservation Office. This would lend more formal, um, the ability, more official ability to apply for tax credits for development projects that preserve the buildings. Consider pursuing a formal National Register nomination for the Indian Run Historic District. That does seem to be a fairly straightforward one that could go fa through fairly quickly. Um, this was kind of mine as an archaeologist. Consider an ordinance that would require property owners to take into consideration impacts to potential archaeological sites. 
Uh, one of the things that came to my mind is when I was looking at that downtown historic district is you have some great backyard archaeology there that would tell you a lot about the history of Dublin that's not written. <laughs> the things that people left out of the historical record. Um, how you would fund that? <laughs> that's just that's just my idea. You could do summer classes. I'm well, when you talk about that, are you talking about, you know, I um, recently with my, my kids had gone through a tour of historic Dublin and um, there used to be a part of the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. uh, and when we walked by the one particular home that I recalled seeing components of that, they had been removed. And um, is that what you're talking about there? Is the what I'm actually talking about is say you have all these great old houses that date to the mid 1800s. Almost all of those had a privy in the backyard. They had outbuildings in the backyard, and the things that you don't learn about everyday life things that aren't written about are usually in the material culture and in your trash in the backyards. And every time, even in my own backyard, which is in a historic neighborhood, you know, every time you dig something up, you find it, but without actually doing um, <clears throat> a systematic investigation, it's hard to interpret what you're finding. So with Dublin, one of the things is, is that just like the log cabin popping up in the middle of a house, you don't know what's there until you actually do a little bit of investigation. And so you know, you could inadvertently end up putting your new, brand new garage over, you know, a very um, interesting archaeological site. Um, happens all the time. Um, and understandably, this is private property, so you have some other considerations there. But uh, that was my, that was the concession to the archaeologist was to throw this in here, because I actually started thinking about it when I was surveying down there, like, man, this would be really cool. It would be cool to compare you know, three houses. Let's see what we know from the archival record and what we can find out from the material record. And what does that tell us additionally about what it was like to live in Dublin in 1850 by three different households, not just one household. But so I, I guess what I was seeing was the potential there for research that could add to your story. Um, I'll let you finish. I have a few more questions, but go ahead. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I mean, one thing I would absolutely consider is the amount of information that we were able to gather that's in the report. It really lends itself well to um, developing public outreach materials, things, and those things, as I heard earlier, could even go into your visitors and convention bureau because historic um, preservation is actually been shown to increase your tourist dollars. Um, so, and there's a lot of different areas you could look at thematically with the material that we collected. Um, there's actually a couple of structures that are pretty unique buildings, like the first underground home in central Ohio is here, the silo house, which I was, I had no idea. So they're not quite 50 years old, but there's things like that that would actually draw in lots of different types of tourists. Um, and then of course, depending on what happens in the long term with this, is that developing materials for owners of properties is within one of the historic districts. I think commercial developers get a lot and commercial property owners get a lot of assistance and local homeowners are often left going, how am I supposed to fix this? How am I supposed to pay for fixing this? Um, I want to do it right, but I'm not sure. So that would be another um, area I think that you could probably reach out to a lot of your citizens with and gain value from the materials that we gathered. And then you probably already have this someplace, but if you go to the Dublin planning uh, website, the whole report's there, it's about 200 pages, and then I don't know, there's like 1,200 pages of appendices or something. So um, there's a lot of information there that um, if you want to get into the uh, details, um, it's available for everybody in Dublin and actually elsewhere. I've got a question. Sure, Mike, go. Um, I've heard from a couple of residents about the two-story log cabin that's been on, on it's fascinating, I'm yeah. sure. And, and, uh, you know, they, they did some nice articles on it, but there was a suggestion by them that it not be that it be put into a place that's more consistent with where it, it came from. And a couple of suggestions were perhaps down in the river park because it came from Riverside. Right. The other uh, the other idea was the Wallace property. It's kind of uh, right there where Kaufman Dead ends into Brand mm -hmm. and back in a setting that is very uh, very private, very rural. Uh, would maybe be consistent with how that might have looked in, uh, back in a day, so. Yeah, that would my, be appropriate, the historic yeah. setting, and to look at that where that would have been a floodplain, yeah. a treed floodplain would be great. I actually talked to Matt about this uh, when we were doing the um, 
artwork dedication at Kosciuszko, Kosciuszko yeah. Park. And uh, I think that it should go in that park because that is the oldest structure we have that is from the original land grant. And I, I kind of threw out a, a challenge to Matt to try to figure out maybe some place on that piece of property. I, I think it is very important it's down the east side of the river. Yeah. And it, I think it's important that it stay in in that original land grant. And uh, well, there was an early suggestion somewhere about maybe Kaufman Park. I just don't think that fits personally. So that's, I just yeah, wanted to raise it. I that. agree. This document is really un unbelievable. It's a fantastic it document. Take us I, two or three more weeks to get through. Just to go through it and to leaf through it, and you stop at an interesting picture, and you have a whole history there. That I mean, it's like walking through history itself. This is a fantastic document. Kudos to whoever is involved in creating this. I, I actually you. feel better knowing that all of this is inventoried and we're getting our arms around this issue. You have a baseline now. Definitely yeah, we have, have a, baseline. a baseline, especially for your buildings. Um, yeah, the amount of uh, that data was kind of insane. Because I think I um, helped put together at least half of those 900 property sheets because at the end we were just kind of <laughs> So yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, there's another split level. <laughs> You know, we would go, my father-in-law had a huge uh, arrowhead and, and all kinds of Indian relics. He could walk in any field anywhere and find them. I mean, even, Ohio it, is that it's way. unbelievable. Uh, I found one dug up in a utility where they dug uh, for uh, utility easement, and it's an incredibly perfect point that's unbelievable. Yeah, Ohio, actually, we grew up here being really, we don't realize how spoiled we are. I do archaeology in other states, and I mean, I walked 13 miles of a pipeline in Michigan in a plowed field, and we found one point. And I was like, what is, <laughs> and I think it's because we have, especially in central Ohio, we have great uh, raw material, stone raw material for making right. um, prehistoric things. And it preserve, and that preserves, so then you can see a lot of it. But yeah, Ohio. So what is your recommendation of where we go from here? So we have a fantastic book of data uh, my ultimate fear is that it would be put on a shelf. And I know it talks a little bit uh, here about um, perhaps doing some uh, historic preservation issues with our code and a few things like that. I'm looking for kind of outside the codified realm of, you know, as a community, um, not as a codified change, not change, but as a community um, you know, what are some of the best ways that we can go from here? And I still want it, would like to know, is there anything we can do about reestablishing um, the Underground Railroad components that we had? Is there any, uh, is, is there any legislative ability to, uh, to preserve that, or is that? Are, are the buildings still there? Mm-hmm. Then I think that, I mean, because really that's, the component that's important because it, that was the stop. People here underground, and it, yeah, a lot of times people did hide in basements, but it's the fact that it was the house, that that's where you went to get your contact to go to the next place. So, those types of houses, you can just put a marker outside. If you're, you know, if you have the archival documentation that that's what it was, just put a sign out front, you know, an interpretive sign, or if you have a particular style of sign. And going forward, what, what do you recommend? Now that we know all this, so we'll, we'll, I'm confident that our wonderful planning department will take to codifying the preservation of it. But what else is there to do? So our uh, next steps were to take back all of the recommendations um, that you saw on the screen and the additional ones that are in the report back to ARB. And as a subbody of council, have them make recommendations for next steps, whether it's the recommendation specifically or where we want to go in that direction. That was our plan for next steps. It, would that, would fund, would be, would participating in any funding of preservation, or are those things included in what you're addressing? I think that they would be. So the next steps are, um, one of the re recommendations is to identify me funding mechanisms. The funding mechanism might be the city of Dublin or a grant program for homeowners or such, if that's where, where the funding wants to come from. But the idea is to identify the opportunities, investigate the ones that are the highest priority more fully, as Ann mentioned. For the amount of work that they did, there was a very limited budget. And going forward, we want to take our resources and implement them on specific priorities. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, this was a great piece of work. Um, and, and one of the recommendations regarding establishing something like a resource bank um, uh, of experts and, you know, whether it's, it, it's uh, there's a financial component to that or whatever, um, I, I think that's a great suggestion. And I know, you know, planning will explore all those ideas and recommendations in more detail. I wanted to ask you if you could briefly um, tell us, I mean, what, what, is, what are the practical implications of expanding the historic district. I'm thinking of the Indian Run neighborhood. I'm, I'm thinking of the, the mid-century. Um, you know, I, I, I guess it, it could apply equally. I mean, in terms of does it, does it have the potential to dramatically um, limit what a homeowner could do in terms of, um, you know, let's say they wanted to ch uh, uh, change their roofing materials, their, how the exterior, um, what ex material they're using for exterior siding, <coughs> Um, if they wanted to add a garage, those kinds of things. Um, I'm, I, I'm thinking of someone I know that lives on Franklin Street and um, who I was having a conversation with this summer and he was wanting to confirm with me that he was not in the, in the historic district. I don't really know what, what his motivation is or was and what his thinking might be. I, I could only speculate that maybe he's thinking that, oh, you know, there'll be a lot of controls, you know, that, that don't apply to me now. Um, first of all, National Register itself, in and of itself, it, all that means is that if there's a federal undertaking, something with federal dollars like ODOT's getting federal, federal money to do a roadway project, um, you have to take into consideration the impacts of that project on the historic resources. It doesn't mean you can't tear anything down, it doesn't mean that you can't build something new, but that's the National Register. And I think more to your point is that if you have a what does the city decide to do with that? Like if you go forward with a National Register nomination, does that then automatically, does the city decide to put that into the historic district? And then how you decide to treat that, I mean, that's really up to you and how you write the guidelines for that. Um, do you just wholeheartedly expand the guidelines you already have from the little district to the bigger district? Or, you know, those, I think those are some of the issues that you'll have to get into the, the you know, the grass. <laughs> on um, in terms of how the city, but really there's no, it's up to you all. How do you want to do it? Any other questions? Uh, okay, uh, Ann? Uh, Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Sale? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Sam Rose Groom? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. And Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Thank you, too. Thank you, uh, fantastic work. Thank you very much, yeah. Uh, resolution 72-17, Ann? This is accepting the lowest and best bid for the Cardinal Health parking lot and site development project. I'll reduce it. Thanks, Tim. This says Donna, but Donna is not no, moving. I'm actually going to give the Michelle. overview of this. I want to take just a couple minutes here to review the background and costs associated with this bid acceptance as are contained in, in your cover memo. This project is associated with the Economic Development Agreement with Cardinal Health that City Council, Council authorized in April of 2016. In 2018, Cardinal Health will occupy the property at 5100, Shire Ring, or 5100 Rings Road excuse me, under a 12-year lease. This 400,000 square foot property will allow Cardinal to consolidate approximately 2,000 employees that are currently located in four other locations throughout Dublin. The city is anticipated to net approximately $26 million in income tax revenue over the term of this 12-year lease. Construction of this parking lot was part of the incentives agreed to in the Economic Development Agreement, and it provides for the construction of 767 parking spaces on city-owned property located on the west side of France Road between Blazer, Parkway, and Rings Road. The project includes drainage improvements, asphalt, paving, curb, curbs, lighting, grading, and landscaping. And then additional elements in the bid specifications include several smart or sustainable features, including rain harvesting, solar panel coverings, car charging stations, bike racks, bioretention facilities, irrigation systems, and storm sewer sampling stations. Also, as a result of a change in stormwater regulations, there's a need to provide additional retention for this site 
and as part of the residual acreage. Uh, finally, to provide site improvements for this residual land for future development, the pond on the northwest corner of France and rings will be repositioned. Uh, with the final construction drawings completed, the engineer's estimates for this project was 3.8 million. The budgeted amount within the CIP was at 2.8 million. On September 19th, three bids were received for this project. George Eigel and company submitted the lowest bid at 4.3 million. Staff thoroughly have reviewed all these bids. Uh, while the bid exceeds the budgeted amount, there are several contributing factors, as, as I just mentioned, including changes to the area stormwater system, site improvements relative to the frontage of France Road and Rings Road, and the introduction of the smart and sustainable technology. Uh, addressing the stormwater and site improvement issues as part of this project will position the city's property for future development, which can result in revenues back to the city via the sale of this residual land. Staff is recommending approval of this bid this evening and sees this as an opportunity for Cardinal Health in the city to finalize the incentives per the EDA and showcase some of these smart and sustainable technologies as well as prepare this residual acreage for future development. Uh, just a final note regarding the increased costs associated with this bid. Staff is evaluating the projects that have been executed that have dollars remaining those that came in under, under, under budget, and also revenues that have come in higher than anticipated in order to fund this gap. Uh, should, should that be insufficient, we would then look to repri reprioritize uh, existing projects that have not been executed. Again, we are recommending approval of this bid, and uh, Donna and Megan are both available this evening if council has additional questions related to it. Questions from council? Um, the smart technology, rain harvesting, uh, that, that term is used for a lot of different things. What does it describe on this particular project? I'm going to ask either Donna or Megan to address that. Uh, the, the rain harvesting feature is a way to um, capture the rainwater and the runoff of the rainwater. Um, and it's a system of almost like an irrigation system that runs within and uh, kind of underneath the parking lot through the uh, areas that are landscaped. Uh, so it's through a bio detention swale? Exactly. Okay. And then it goes to stormwater detention? Right. As Michelle mentioned, the stormwater uh, retention pond that is there now is not sufficient for the site. So this project will actually relocate the stormwater retention to a different area on the parcel. And where is that going to be relocated to? No, I'm going to go. So this map shows um, uh, an aerial of the site. The black markings are the outlines of the parking spaces. The blue outlined areas is where the new retention ponds will be. And the pond that is there currently will uh, no longer be there. And that turns that, that area that, um, in front of Fran that's adjacent to France Road into a developable parcel. 
So then are these the rain harvesting corridors right here? That's correct. Okay. Um, I am hopeful that those are not things that we tried to value engineer if you, uh, you know, visit the Dublin Methodist Hospital. They're done wrong far more than they're done right. And when they're done wrong, they become tremendously problematic for maintenance, appearance. Um, so we don't, you know, I don't know what we did with those, but, you know, I, I hope that that those are done particularly well. Can you uh, indicate where the solar panel coverings would? Yeah, so this, the solar panels, let me see if I can. Are they, are those, these two locations here? They are. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, this mouse doesn't have a, That's okay. an I arrow got on it. But yes, those are the areas. And we, um, there are um, 16 spaces in total. Okay, and um, Will those be movable or fixed to the those east? Those will be fixed. Okay. Um, so they'll likely have a easterly orientation to them. They will. So they'll uh, the the panels will tilt to. Oh, so they are not fixed. The panels are fixed to the pavement, but the panels themselves will tilt. Okay. So they are movable. Um, the, then the car changing st stations, I'm assuming, are underneath those panels to capture that energy? There are some that are underneath, and there are also some that are closer. Um, you can kind of see where um, the spaces are located. Yes, uh, toward, yes, toward okay. the top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and do they capture the power from these panels, or do they, are they wired independently? Uh, I don't believe, I don't believe the power captured through the solar panels is being directed to the charging stations. I believe okay. that's separate. Um, then the irrigation system, um, there is a, a makeup well here and there is yes. a pump located at this. Are we reutilizing those pieces of equipment? We will, those will be repurposed. Okay, and are these two ponds connected? They are not connected. The walkway is, uh, that goes between those two ponds is intended to uh, direct pedestrian traffic between the two areas. So uh, do you know where the, the pump station, which of these two ponds? Uh, you know, I, I guess my question is, are, are these two water levels going to be held constant with one another? That's um, a, a little bit more, let me look at Paul. I, that's an engineering question I can't okay. answer. I'd, I'd want to make sure that these two are connected so that they hold the same water level if we're okay. going to locate the makeup well and the pump to this location and we pump and fill only one pond. Oh, I see. A couple things right. happen. One is their appearance becomes significantly different so that this pathway would be not mm -hmm. as good of an experience. Um, two is you compromise the ecosystem so you have uh, a rotating, more uh, oxygenated water supply in this pond and not so much in here. You're going to have fight vegetative growth and all those kinds of things. There, there's a lot of different reasons, but I, I mm -hmm. want to make sure that these are connected with one another. All right. Um, I'll, I understand the concern. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the storm sewer sampling stations, what can you tell me about those? I, I honestly don't have the information on those. Again, I'm going to look at Yeah, I, I don't have the detail on those, okay. but I can get that information for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be interested in, in seeing what it is. Or, I mean, for, I'm assuming all of these things look very expensive, um, and I just would like to know what it is we're going to do with the information that we gather through, through that sampling process. Well, the information that we gather, we've already spoken to, there's a, um, a research scientist out of Ohio State University that specializes in that area. Um, and they will have students in classes that actually come to collect the data so that they can monitor and, and track the data. Okay. Um, at present, uh, at the Cardinal facility, are there car, cha car charging stations um, at their facility on Emerald Parkway? There are not. There are not. And is this, are, are these requests at the response of of their bidding, is, is this what they asked for or are these things that we feel as a city we are important to construct? They Who's the not, driver? 
Certainly, they did not ask for these as the project team worked to develop the, the plans and the design for the parking lot. The city and the uh, and Cardinal Health just agreed that if there were smart features that we could incorporate into this parking lot, it would make a great um, uh, test lab, if you will, test site for these features. Okay. Uh, I, I, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so, so I understand that there's the base parking lot, mm -hmm. which is the arrangement that we made with Cardinal because we need to keep Cardinal in touch. Correct. Okay. And then these smart features are kind of the bells and whistles that we added on top of that to be able to showcase this concept to any mm -hmm. other companies. That, that is correct. The smart features that are being incorporated are not part of the economic development agreement. We are not contractually obligated to provide those. And there wouldn't be any limitation on us sharing what we learn from all of that with other companies, would there? I mean, no, it? not at all. I mean, anything, because this is a publicly owned, it's a city owned asset, it's public information, so we would be able to share that. And this them. bid and awarding this contract would be would keep us on schedule. I know that they are anxious to get in that building and get moving. This allows them to do that? That's correct. Any other questions? I don't have any interest in holding up the parking lot for the Cardinal folks. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about some of these. Um, you know, I think it was indicated in here that these smart technologies added about a half a million dollars to the project. A little less than that. I believe it's three hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars is the what the total of it. The smart features are if you just pull those out. Okay. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I, the, we got to move forward with the parking lot because that's. Mm -hmm. That's very important to do. The smart stuff, I'd like to know a little bit Certainly. more about what it is that we're getting for that, you know, what, what sure. those are. Yeah, I'm happy to come back and, and provide some more information about those smart features in particular and, uh, and do a, a little bit deeper analysis on those for you. That'd be great. Problem. Thank you for that, Donna. Any other questions? Uh, okay, Ann. Mayor Peterson. Yes. I'm Ms. Ambrose Grooms. Yes, looking Ms. forward to the updates. Ms. Sale? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Okay, staff comments. Michelle? We have uh, two items I just wanted to bring up. Uh, one, we are looking for a motion from council regarding the reorganization of our Division of Community Relations. Um, the city manager provided a memo outlining the reasons and recommendations regarding this reorganization. And staff is asking for a motion this evening. Um, includes three items. Uh, the first is to adopt the new title for the division, which would be communications and public information. The second is to adjust the personnel data in the 2017 operating budget page to reflect uh, the staffing changes that uh, are outlined in Dana's memo. And the third is to waive the competitive selection process for the Director of Communications and Public Information and the Public Affairs Officer. Uh, if you have any questions related to the details within the memo, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions from Council? We, we had some questions when we initially discussed this, and I, I think I, I'm not terribly comfortable moving forward on, on that particular part without Dana being present. I think this was his uh, his reorg, and he probably would be most uh, capable of answering those questions. I, I don't know if it's uh, an emergency or if it's something we can wait for. Our, our next meeting is what, October 9th? Mm -hmm. Can it wait till October 9th? We could wait till October 9th. Okay, let's wait till October 9th. You had another issue, Michelle. Also in your informational packet was uh, information related to Concord Road shared use paths. Uh, we continue to have discussions with Concord Township trustees related to this project or potential project. On uh, August 8th, Concord Township did hold a public involvement meeting. They had approximately 60 residents attend that. Um, there's some information in here as to information that they were surveyed regarding, uh, which was in, in the memo. Uh, based on this information and 
the residents interested in moving forward with this project, Concord Township Trustees held a meeting on September 13th and they did approve hiring a consulting firm to do the surveying and design for a shared use path. Um, they do anticipate that the design of the shared use path could be completed by the end of November of this year. Uh, staff is recommending that Dublin contribute funding for the construction of a portion of the shared use path. There are uh, several properties that um, are part of this from D side drive north. And uh, we, right now the estimate for this portion is looking at uh, approximately $50,000. Once we have a more defined number, we will make sure that council is aware of that. Uh, funding is available for this, and we would plan to encumber the funds this year so that they are available when Concord Township moves forward. Uh, unless council wishes otherwise, staff would plan to move forward with this contribution. No, no motions necessary in, in, unless council wishes otherwise. So, Michelle, there mentions in here that the, the Concord Township trustees suggested a kickoff meeting. Um, to include Concord Township, City of Dublin, and um, ACOM. So when, is there, is that already scheduled or? That has not been scheduled yet, but I will reach out. I plan on reaching out to um, Bart Johnson tomorrow to see when we can get that scheduled. Okay. Um, just because I've been really intimately involved with this process and have talked to a lot of residents both in Concord Township and in the city of Dublin mm -hmm. um, and in Muirfield. Um, I would love to, at a minimum, be tangentially involved with that, if not involved with it, um, when you guys put together what that will look like. Okay. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thanks. And I believe the main intent of that meeting is to ensure that Dublin engineering staff is involved in the design of that portion of the project. So right. I believe it's that's meant to be a, good thing. a smaller Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's totally fine and appropriate. Um, I just, I know that this has been a project that has been near and dear to a lot of people's hearts and it's been kind of fits and starts and starts and stops. And so I guess I just want to take a, a gentle guiding hand to ensure that we work with our Concord Township friends to make this small bit of path happen in our little corner of the world. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Megan, for all of your work on it. Excuse me, I, I just want to confirm that our funding contribution is, is, is limited to the northernmost property boundaries of the homes that are in Dublin? Yes, the amount that we included in the memo is our best estimate based on, at this point we don't have any design for the west side of the road or the path along the west side of the road. And that amount is our best estimate up to Dublin's corporation limits on the west side. Okay, so, so the already... yellow, the yellow here that's, that's I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. The, the yellow that's reflected here um, beyond this northern property limit, that would be the responsibility of Concord Township? That would be our intent as we have those discussions with Concord Township. At this point, Concord Township has only made the decision to fund the design of that, um, the path along the west side of the road. And then the plan is that once they have that design available, then that will inform the construction estimate. So at this point, they haven't discussed funding of construction. They haven't come to us requesting anything. They basically made the decision, we're gonna proceed with design. Hopefully the design will be complete towards the end of the year, and then they're gonna talk about construction funding. This is the recommendation of 50,000 in the memo is Dublin staff being proactive, anticipating that that conversation is gonna occur. We have the funds in the budget this year, and we wanna make sure that we preserve the opportunity to participate in the project if and when they decide to proceed with the path along the west side of the road. Okay, I, I wanna make sure that I understand. You're anticipating a request from them, a request for us to go forward with our portion of the path. Well, we would, our plan or our recommendation would be that we only proceed with building that portion in conjunction with them continuing the path to the north. So. Our thought would be that that would be one project okay. in cooperation with Concord Township. Okay. It just wouldn't make sense for us to build a portion of the path up to the corporation limit that okay. then just dead ends into nothing. Okay. But Which is why we haven't done it today. We built the path on both sides of the road. We have it up to logical termini. Essentially, we have path up to the two most northern streets on either side of Concord Road. But with the expectation that Concord Township will share in the funding. Oh yes. For yes. 
what's within their jurisdiction. Yes. Got it. That Thank you. That would be our recommendation. Thanks. Looks like about half of it's in Dublin, roughly, and half of it's in Concord Township, yes. plus or minus 10 percent or so. Yes. And at least funding the design is more than they've agreed to do in the past. Exactly. Anything else on this issue, Michelle? That is it. Any other staff comments? Nothing. All right. Then we go to committee reports. P and Z, Amy. I was just, <clears throat> excuse me. I was just curious um, from planning. Um, we have the um, project to talk about all of the business areas and sort of the redevelopment of those areas. And there are a couple neighborhoods that are very curious about when that's going to move forward. And I didn't know what the timeline was on that. I don't see anybody here necessarily from planning. So, Michelle, get back you, to you on that. Yeah, if you could get back to us, I'd appreciate the timetable for that. Thank you. Admin Mike. Uh, we have a meeting, <coughs> excuse me, scheduled for November 1st for interviews. Uh, it'll be Wednesday from 6 to 8. So, put that on your calendar. Community development, John's not here. Uh, it looks like the committee will meet on Monday, October 30th at 6 p.m. Finance Committee, Mike? We have uh, selected a date of November 27th uh, for the bed tax uh, grants, the applications. So that will be held that evening. And I think we decided at 6 o'clock is my recollection. Very good. Public Services, Amy? Friendship Association, Christina? Uh, so we did meet um, at our last meeting. We did a bunch of debriefing. Uh, we hadn't met since just prior to the Irish Festival. So we debriefed the Irish Festival, the friendship agreement that we made, and the gathering of the Dublins. Um, we also talked a little bit about what our three-year engagement plan should be relative to our two friendship cities, both with Moscow and with Dublin, Ireland. Um, and our plan is to sit down and figure out how we focus on cultivating those relationships as well as what our potential for, you know, possible other relationships are, or should we sort of stay focused? So if some of those discussions, I think um, in the coming couple of next meetings, we'll be really focused on um, constructing what our plan should be over the next year. Uh, we also debriefed this school's trip to Moscow, which this body also got an opportunity to hear from the students themselves, which is great. Um, we talked about friendship city signs um, in some of the other areas where um, folks have friendship city relationships. Um, they actually have signs indicating that relationship, and so we talked about what that potentially could look like. So we're researching that as well. Um, we also talked about the potential for doing like a Dublin cricket clinic. I've been approached by um, a couple of different um, friends that I have that happen to be Indian, and they are really passionate about cricket. And um, wouldn't it be kind of fun to bring in other groups to explain what cricket is, how cricket works? and do some clinics. So we, we explored that, and we'll be talking about that as well. We also talked about the upcoming Bread Festival, which is on 1021, so mark your calendars. I believe that's a bye week, so that should be a really good thing. It is. Yes, and that stands for Bake, Reconnect, Educate, Make Art, and Celebrate Diversity. Um, so uh, that is something that's put on through the Dublin Arts Festival. And then uh, finally, the Chili Cook-Off, which is October 14th in the Historic District, which is $15, and um, those proceeds go to assist with the Dublin Food Pantry. Um, our next meeting is in approximately two months, and we'll begin some of the work I just mentioned. Thanks. Thank you. Tim Morpsey. Uh, what I recall from the Morpsey meeting was uh, a lot of excitement over uh, Columbus Central Ohio being named as um, one of the finalists uh, for this Hyperloop project, where we're going to put you in a capsule well. in a tube and shoot you to Chicago in 28 minutes. Good. So uh, stay tuned. Great candidate. Um, like. No, I mean, it was, I mean, uh, the, 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 the name finalist, um, you know, we were in some uh, esteemed company. So, uh, and Pittsburgh in 18 minutes, I think. So yes. anyway. 18 minutes. So. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's like the bank. Not team. anymore, man. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what so. they said. It's like how they I'm not. Hey, they don't come out of the, they don't come out of the locker yeah. room. I'm not supporting them. So buckle up. Uh, don't turn off your mic yet. Logan Union, Champaign County. Nothing. How about the uh, US 33 Innovation Corridor Group? Nothing. I, I know we have a meeting coming up, if not this Friday, the following Friday. Okay. Uh, Dublin Arts Council, I would just point out that we went up and dedicated the Feather Point, I believe they call it. I saw it for the first time last night lit up. Looks very nice. 
great plug. And just there. a quick plug. The, yep. the little video is really great, and um, it, it's cute. My youngest is in there very excited about how tall it was compared to him. Oh. And I asked him, I said, how, how tall do you think that is? And he goes, 20. And it is. It's 20 feet. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay. Uh, Dublin Board of Education, Chris, Christina. Uh, our next meeting is the 25th of October. We have not met since we were together last. Uh, and I don't have anything with Washington Township. I don't think the chief is here. Um, we will introduce Eric Richter the next time he is here. He's the one that replaced Sarah Ott. Eric's a good friend. He was in Union County. Now he's with the township. Um, Roundtable. Amy? Tim? Nothing. Chris? You didn't pick me first. Wow. Uh, I don't have anything other than the, the Feather Point was a really neat dedication and the artist, I, it was, the Polish community was, they, were really they came there. out, they, they showed up. They showed up. Yeah. And uh, showed up. those little bread, salted breads yeah. were delicious and um, uh, it was really, I didn't know that we had such an involved Polish community that was fun. So, great job to the event staff who put that on in the little and they band. I coordinated the whole thing. It must must have been with David, uh, you know, and the Arts Council, with the, the artist and the Kosciuszko and the, the whole thing was very, very well done. Yep. I'm good. Mike? Uh, as am I, the only thing I would uh, mention is the Taste of Dublin with the Chamber of Commerce is tomorrow night. Looking forward to that. I think it's at 6, yes, maybe. I'm sure you can get... I'm sure you can still get tickets, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, with that, we are adjourned.